So I would like to call to order the South Burlington <coughs> City Council meeting of Monday, December 16th, 2019. And we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. David, do you want to read that? Sure. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And so before we move on to item two, I just want to um, take this opportunity to wish everyone who watches this a wonderful, joyful holiday season. And we hope you are safe, that we get some good snow for skiing, <laughs> but not too much to um, cause the road department to have to be out <laughs> for hours and hours and hours and hours over many days. So. That is my wish. Okay, item two, instructions on exiting the building in case of an emergency. If there's an emergency tonight, please leave the, uh, the room by going out one of these two exit doors, going through the parking lot to the south and ending up beyond the building to the south of us in the parking lot beyond. If these doors are blocked for some reason, please go back out the main entrance, out the front, and around to the same parking uh, lot to the building to beyond. It. Tom Hubbard and I will be responsible for clearing the building, so leave immediately. All righty. Agenda review. Are there any additions, deletions, or changes in the order of items? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to comments and questions from the public not related to the agenda. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> um, you need to identify yourself oh yes. for the My name right. is Paula De Michael, and I am a resident at the Pines, and I am currently on the Affordable Housing Committee. But I want to make it on the record that I am speaking for myself as a member of the committee, not for the committee, mm -hmm. and also mainly as a voter and a resident tonight, when you okay. hear what I have to say. Uh, I'm coming to ask you to start taping the Planning Commission meetings, but I would like to give you some of my reasons. Um, I've been at at least three since late August, three or four, I've lost count now, um, relating to what our committee is doing with the IZ bylaw, which you're going to have before too much longer. But um, some th other things happened at the committee. The first one I went to, the lawyer, Daniel Seff, turned up, talked for 20 minutes about the lawsuit that's pending in the Supreme Court and was trying to get them to delay sending the TDR amendment to you. And I don't have to go into the politics of that, I'm sure. I didn't understand what was going on at that point. I was too new here. It was important. I mean, he, he said a lot. He said it clearly. It's something that I feel, uh, looking back on it, and even at the time, I was wondering why there was no tape running. I know there's an audio tape. Let me, right. let me put that aside. Um, and some other things that have happened since then that have been important. But I've also been accumulating a lot of information. I've been talking to people because I'm new here and I'm still in uh, information gathering mode so that I can work effectively on the committee. So one of the people I've talked to recently is uh, John Dinklage, who used to be on the DRB and he used to be a council member. Somebody forwarded him, me, him, me to him and he's just a mine of information. So I've had a couple of phone conversations, long ones with him. And I wanna try to connect some dots about why I think what's coming needs to be taped, okay? So be patient. Um, I don't own property, but this whole place runs on taxes. And he, uh, he gave me to understand that the entirety of South Burlington is up for revaluation now, private and mm -hmm. public. Okay, I didn't know that. And I had started discussing the possibility, which is in the bylaw, the allowance for it is in the bylaw, that in the transit overlays were proposing that within those commercial areas, that housing could be built, and specifically affordable housing. And I will say, I have no problem in principle with that, but some of the things he said have given me a concern. Um, he told me that historically, 
Uh, Sobu has kept the tax base since the 70s even, 50-50, or tried to, between commercial and residential. And you can tell me if this is wrong. Now, what he told me was that now it's 40-60 or close to that. And the, the commercial base has gone down. And that that is a serious concern. And then he asked me a question. He said, what do you think is going to happen when that mall is revalued? Well, we went through this in Essex with IBM. And the tax differential landed on the village. And there were some really unhappy people there for quite a while. Um, so I have a concern. At one of the Planning Commission meetings, and Paul isn't here, so I can't reference him, we were forwarded some documents, and I'm not sure where they came from. I don't think they came from the PC. I think they came through the PC. There are four documents that Paul has. Someone had done research on how TDRs are used uh, and found four municipalities across the country. Right, that's in our packet. Okay, to, they tonight. use them exclusively in commercial areas, 100%. And we were sent those back in, I believe, October. And after talking to John, and this is my concern about taping the meetings from now on because this is going to come up, um, I had to ask myself, is that percentage, if we're talking about porting housing in commercial areas, is that percentage not going to be critical? Because if you're talking about anything near 100%, if you're talking about 80%, what John said was how, uh, housing taxes. 80% of? Of TDR receiving areas. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't say receiving areas. I apologize. This is, this is new to me. It's hard for me to keep some of it straight. It's about what those municipalities did was put their receiving areas 100% in commercial. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is, this is a serious discussion. Any discussion about this, the percentage is going to affect taxes directly. Although I didn't think Seattle did. I thought Seattle ha had included some residential. I could okay. be wrong. No, all I'm saying is it's going, to, it's, it's going to come up. It's already out there. I didn't know you have something about TDRs on the agenda tonight. I just saw this. Um, so this is coincidental. I really didn't know that was on there. Um, and I am not faulting anybody for suggesting anything. I'm just saying there's a context here that's bigger than just where we're going to put affordable housing. It's how much uh -huh. where we're going to put it. So I am asking you to tape the Planning Commission meetings because I think this is going to come up shortly. Um, and it's going to stay there for the next year. And I realize we're halfway through a budget cycle. You would have to come up with enough to tape for six months, and then I'm, uh, what I am asking you is putting it in the new budget. It's, I think it's something between one and $3,000. I don't think it's a whole lot. I hope it's the lower end and not the higher end. But I don't think it's going to break the budget to put something in to tape those meetings for a year. Um, I just, it's not only this issue, it's, it's hearing Seth there and the things he was saying as a lawyer and about this case and um, minutes, no matter how good they are, never reflect the whole discussion. Sure. And yeah. the audio tape, I'm not sure, I know we audio taped in Essex and you never know when part of the tape is going to be blank, people are talking over each other, I mean all kinds of things used to happen out there where we couldn't get back from the tape what we needed. So this is why I'm suggesting videotape. And um, I, uh, I mean, as a voter, I would like to be able to get at these discussions as they go on this year, because I know I won't be able to go all the meetings. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's it. And that's my rationale there. OK, thank, <laughs> thank you, you very much, Ms. Paulette. Any other um, comments or thoughts from the public? Yes. Yeah, um, this would be really quick. Um, Roseanne Greco. Uh, somebody just brought to my attention that there is no sign on the Underwood property that says it's the Underwood property. I mean, there's that big sign that says we're saving, you know, land and blah. But if you wanted to find the Underwood property, there's no way okay. you would be able to find it. And, and I, I, as many times as I, I pass by it every single day, I've never noticed that the word Underwood is nowhere on that sign. We have Red Rock signs. We've got Wheeler Park, you know. Um, Farrell, Szymanski, but we just don't have a label for the Underwood property. Okay. Just offer people. Thank you. We can get so parochial, can't we? I know what's going on on the routes that I drive. 
all the time. <laughs> and I, I never notice that either because I don't get over there very often. <laughs> so thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right, moving on to number five, announcements and the city manager's report. Tom, you want to start with announcements? Well, okay. ugly sweater on. I wore a really ugly suit, and uh, it was a great time. Good, good attendance. No, wait a minute. My there. husband has that jacket. He doesn't <laughs> have the pants. But I almost wore it tonight, but I figured it would uh, I don't know, be oh, on the record too have. long. What was the total amount of I don't know. The summary will be this Thursday. Jay Pascal's pulling the numbers together. It was a good turnout. Okay, Megan. I. No, I, I didn't even make it to the ugly sweater run. I had a daughter with an upset stomach, so I'm sorry to have missed that. But okay, um. quiet week, Dave. Uh, no, nope, it was the end of the <laughs> end of the end of the term. Not much time for much else. I, Tim. Uh, so I had the opportunity to uh, interview uh, nine, 17 uh UVMMC applicants for the medical college as part of the MMI program. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah it's great. A lot of great uh, young people. Mm -hmm. uh, also ran the ugly, ugly sweater run for the first time. I know it's the third annual. It wasn't I, in an ugly I sweater, though. I didn't though. have an ugly sweater, and I apologize. I'll try harder next year, but at least <laughs> I was there. And, uh, Did they and give you tinsel or something? That's what I, they I just, you know, no. it was blowing like 30 miles an hour, 26 black. degrees. I figured just showing up and actually running it was a pretty good deal, and um, and they had excellent refreshments. I was really uh, amazed at the, at the quality of refreshments. And as you know, last week we met for the CIP meeting, Monday night the Climate Action Caucus from legislators, and uh, I was able to, to sit in for the first 20 minutes of the uh, White Street Bike Lanes meeting that same night. So, yeah, and there there weren't a lot of people there, maybe five or six that asked questions about it. I, yeah, it's a tough time. It, it seemed like you know there was no objection to it. Uh, you know, they, have, they have a good story, and it, it'll be a good request, and I think it's pretty low cost. So just trying to push that along. Okay. That's all I have. So I did walk in the ugly sweater. I did have an ugly sweater. You walked in the ugly sweater, and you. And I wore an ugly sweater. Properly uniform. I, and I actually had two hats on. One that I came in, and then I got the gift hat. <laughs> I put it on top, and I was glad because it was chilly. It's a good hat. I walked a little bit farther than the regular walkers, because um, that's my morning walk with my best friend. Um, and I agree that refreshments were lovely. It was really nice to have it inside as well. <laughs> I mean, the tents, it's kind of cool at Memorial, Veterans Memorial Park, but when it is cool, it's, it's really tough. So I hope that that's uh, the school board or whoever lets you rent space or use space keeps that going forward so that was really lovely and I did go to the climate um, meeting and I found that um, you know very informative and really helpful I was pleased and impressed with how many South Burlingtonians showed up for that I mean there probably was I don't know 50 or 60 people in the audience it was a lot and the presentation was um, really helpful so I, I'm glad they came to our community and, um, you know, a good number of us were there. And let's see, what else did I do? I don't think I did anything else. I, uh, I yes, always like to let you do the thing that I saw you at. Um, afterward, uh, the, um, the Climate Caucus, I spoke uh, with the two legislators that were there, um, Chris Pearson and Sarah, Sarah, Hazi, yeah. Copeland. Yes. Copeland is something like that. I'm, I apologize. Thank you. From Brandon, right? Yeah. Yes, I recall. She's yeah, okay. Hardwick. Hardwick, okay. Hardwick, okay. And um, I was very glad to hear that in addition to what they spoke about during the, the presentation, that our plans here in the city very much fit the plans for um, you know the climate caucus which is reforestation making sure that we have that, that those green lungs in order to you know take in the carbon dioxide also affordable housing um, is really really important in terms of keeping the number of cars on the roads 
as low as possible. If employees can live close to their jobs, that is the best thing we can do to, to combat um, climate change. And, I, you know, I also, you know, heard from Chris that they're, they're definitely involved in a reforestation project and working with people who, um, you know, uh, work the, the woodlands in the state, uh, you know, for a job to just to, you know, that that is part of the piece. So I just really think it's important to put those out there, that what we're working on here in terms of a balance between housing for our workforce as well as our green infrastructure fits into that whole, that whole climate um, uh, cause, I guess. Mm -hmm. One thing they didn't really touch on was the ability of the state to absorb CO2 because of all its forest, right? This was like 100% denuded like 100 years ago, and now it's 80, 85 percent, right. you know, reforested. So there's probably opportunity there to extend that. But we have, you know, a lot of forests. So. Well, if you recall too, um, Brandon or Brendan, I never remember his last name from Bread and Butter Farm, was talking about the carbon sequestration. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, that they're trying to achieve at Bread and Butter farm by not doing as much tilling, the carbon stays in the um, land or the ground, and um, and that that's a plus. So um, yeah, we've got a number of different pieces, and um, but also and older I, trees take in much more yes. carbon dioxide right, right. than younger trees. But, I think that's what they said, yeah. The older they are, the more That was at our are. meeting here yeah, right. just two weeks ago. So yeah, yeah. I think those are, um, yeah. you know, it was important. And then another one of their legs was just the um, being held accountable. And um, I think we're lucky to have a very active and well-informed energy committee that keeps us <laughs> pushing and reminding us and um, and I think that's that's important because if you don't keep track of what you're doing or how close you are to your goals, you never know when you get there if you ever do. So why have goals? So we are lucky in that respect to have some really talented people in this community who care about it. So I was also busy um, baking this week. There are some cookies for the audience. Where? Please and gifts for my friends. And for the staff. Thank yeah. You very much. Yeah. So, you know, this is just a, a small <laughs> way of um, really acknowledging, I thank okay. you for showing up. Thank you. I know a lot of people show up uh, by TV, which is great, but it's also kind of nice for us to have some live humans out there to talk to and, and respond, and we appreciate all that you do. That's delicious. City manager's report. Yeah. Thanks, Helen. Uh, a lot of scheduling things. So no, I um, sent you multiple emails today about Secretary Flynn uh, <laughs> being at the um, Kimball Avenue, Marshall Avenue Bridge at 2 o'clock tomorrow. Those of you who can make it, great. If you can't, understand. Um, we'll, Justin will be there early on the South Burlington side. You can park. You can park inside the barrier, but okay. before the bridge. Um, you can walk across the bridge. Um, and uh, Justin will have hard hats and, and uh, anything else needed to be in a construction area. Um, also, at the same time, uh, Suzanne Young, who's the governor's uh, secretary of administration and perhaps the governor himself will be at the library talking about multiple other governmental priorities around budgeting and some other things. At our library, I should say. Yeah, that's from 2 to 3.30. Yeah, so that's a longer meeting, I think. Right, you might go scoop um, over there. Very pleased to report again to you all that the Garden Apartments, uh, Champlain Housing Trust, 60 units of affordable and market rate housing will be um, dedicated, I guess, on the 13th of January at 2 p.m. All are invited to come to that. Reminder that the regular meeting of the council, which would normally occur on the 6th of January, has been canceled or postponed to the 13th, and that that meeting will be the will be the uh, uh, major part of the agenda will be the budget workshop and, and uh, following on to Tom's presentation tonight. 
Uh, I attended the CCRP, the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission legislative breakfast last week, which was very, uh, I thought it was very well done. Uh, CCRPC has a range of issues um, now um, that would seem to span beyond just the traditional planning thing. So a lot about transportation, which is planning and other things, but also about mental health and uh, uh, community health and other things like that. So we had, uh, they had very good turnout of legislators. Uh, so it was, a, it was well done, it was a good meeting. Um, also, one last thing, um, at a prior meeting, uh, the council decided that um, you had an interim zoning application for 550 Park Road uh, mm -hmm. over off the golf course. Um, uh, and now you can deliberate on that, um, having provided input to your direction on it. Do we have a draft decision? Um, there will be a draft, and it's going to come to you electronically. And the hope is that you can vote on this electronically okay. rather than waiting to the 13th of January so that right. so that the affected parties can move forward since it was one of those things you decided was kind of outside of IZ. And so you can be looking for that in your email. Soon? I mean this week? Soon. Or, okay. Yeah, possibly this week. <coughs> All right. That's it. Great. Thank you. Next item is item six, the consent agenda. We have um, signed disbursements and two applications, grant applications. One for the design of the UVM horticultural farm stormwater treatment practice and the other for the Kimball Marshall Avenue bicycle and pedestrian facilities over Muddy Brook. I'll move to approve. Second. Second. Any Second. comments or questions? Yes. Do, yeah. do we have any knowledge whether the stormwater treatment practices at the UVM Hort Farm are near any man-made structures that have basements? <laughs> we actually have our stormwater director with us tonight, if you'd like him to Yes, that would be great. Do you mind coming up, Tom, please? Just, just a quick question. I mean, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. We should put Here, that on the... You <laughs> take your pick. Put it on, the, um, on that table, please. Uh, was there going to be a basin? I'm sorry. So. So every time, from now on, every time there's a stormwater change application, permit, whatever it is that comes before us, right, I'm going to ask the question, are there any basements that are in the vicinity of that <laughs> stormwater pond or new catchment system that could be affected by a change in ground level, groundwater? This, this proposed project is in the upper field at the Hort Farm. Okay. Uh, so there's no homes around it, but it'll treat the water from a number of yeah. homes. Okay. Okay. That's what I figured, but I just wanted to, since you're here, thank Great. you. Thank All right. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? You ready for the vote? All in favor of approving the consent agenda as proposed? Aye. 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 Okay. We now move on to the budget considerations and council discussion right here, right? Uh, yep. Yeah. And Tom Hubbard? Gonna leave that, I guess. The date? What is it? The 12th, 16th, uh, 19th. Let's <laughs> put 72. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know where that came out of. Okay. So the Tom. FY21 draft budget remains a work in progress. Um, I, I would expect to have the full draft to you sometime this week, which will give you a, a good amount of time to look at it before our January 13th meeting and certainly available to, to questions that you have once you receive it uh, throughout that time in advance of the meeting. Um, I, I really do want to emphasize it's a work in progress. We're, we're rechecking figures, especially salary and benefit information, which is a bit complicated based on contracts, and we want to make sure it's correct. Um, and uh, wanted to make sure that we had the amendment approved tonight, which will be coming up, uh, so that we'll know exactly what the, the CIP will consist of. But I did put some of the major uh, data in, in a summary sheet here 
uh, with some of the major cost factors that we're looking at. Uh, these are things that I think I've shared with you for the most part in past meetings, but just to kind of summarize the, the health care, uh, our insurance, uh, contractual agreements, the CIP, uh, the pension increase, and the proposed new FTEs, one for the Parks Maintenance Division of DPW, and two uh, 28 hour positions within the library that are proposed to move to 40 hour positions. Since the one position doesn't exist and the other two were part time, benefit calculations have also been made for those positions. So they are in the proposed budget. It currently stands at, a, uh, I think it's a 3.73% increase. Um, I'm not sure if that's what it will still be at by the time you get it or not, but um, like 3.73% increase in the tax rate over, over last year's budget. And um, we'll continue to work on that over the next few days and, and shoot to get that out to you by the end of the week. The revenue uh, growth major factors for us there, we are, uh, Todd is pretty comfortable with a 1% pro uh, projected growth in the grand list. Uh, we're paying off the upfit of the vet center and the CJC. Paying so off like it'll, it'll be done after it'll this. It'll be it'll be done. Yeah, no more pay payments. Ahead thing or um, so so we've been putting about that amount of money in each year. So that's money we don't have to put in this year. Uh, oh, oh, I see. Okay, got it. Uh, we a three percent uh, increase in the budget. You can see what that generates for for revenue. And then the difference in the interest income uh, by switching to banks, you can see what, what that generates for us. So we have a bit of a delta there, almost $80,000 between the big factors of between expenses and revenues. And we'll continue to, to refine this um, as best we can before you get it later this week. Uh, is there, are there things that would be helpful to you um, in terms of a narrative that uh, to go with the draft budget? I'd can be I, happy can, to. Can I just ask a question? Sure. I'm, I'm blanking. Why is a 3% budget increase considered revenue? Uh, that's just to show you what a 3% increase would generate. So oh, if we. If taxes we, or, or, oh, okay. So based I, on past I, history, if we used, yeah, no, that's a good point, Helen. Um, if if we didn't show something, we we'd certainly have a a, a bigger a bigger delta. Um, but based on past history, we we use three percent. Um, I probably should say three percent tax increase, right? To fund an increase of three percent in the budget. How much of an okay. increase is the insurance combo? Well, health care is 10%, the, right? Yeah, the 10% on the health care. The rest of our insurance is about $89,000. So. Yeah. Is that an increase, though, of a certain... Uh, the group life insurance rates have changed, so there's, there's a bit of a change there. Um, some contract agreements and then our property and workers comp you know right, which so typically it's too see complicated for us to yeah i mean you'll you'll still all be spelled out i think our i think our property and workers comp is probably a, about 40 together uh in terms of an increase there but i interrupted you because you asked you were about to ask no that, uh, that's fine. what kind of narrative additional narrative things um is the council looking to see or, or what or what other or types what other of information stuff, yeah. would be helpful to you along with a draft of the budget so you'll you'll have every line item um, you'll have at least three years of history um, the percentage increase uh, per line item you know if that's helpful we can list it out that way as we've done in the past any thoughts we're going to talk about this some more next time, right? So, yeah. Yeah. so basically, what 
what we've right. done. Um, well, I mean, in terms of any more information you want. Well, well I'd like to know more about what the FTEs are going to be. Yeah. Doing. Yeah. yeah. So, sure. so that's the purpose of the 13th, really. That's okay. when we'll have all our department managers here, and um, and they can talk about why they they feel that's important, and and you can make your judgments uh, as you need to. Um, what what we've tried to done, what we've tried to do to date, is take everything that we receive from departments, and basically put a priority on it and, and there's a number of things we've we've already cut we started well over seven percent but that's typical that, that we'll get a budget and it'll be bigger than than we know uh we would be reasonable so we we've begun trimming that down and what you'll see is what we feel is a reasonable ask and you may not feel it's reasonable you may say we need to cut more and that's why it, it's presented before you. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to look at it over the next couple of days. But like I said, I think right now it's, it's about 3.73 is, is where we've got it at this point. 3% budget increase. I'd like to see that be the only budget increase and <laughs> not have a delta of 80,000. If we, you know, and I've always said this, if we could drive it under three, that'd be great, you know, but you've got a lot of challenges. And um, it seems like we've been hitting three close, pretty close for the last right. four years. Um, so what is 0.73 equate in dollars? Is that the 79? Is that the $80,000? Right, $80,000? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's, that would, the 80, I, I did, I did run that figure. I think that brings it down to like 3.21. And I'm sorry. If you took if you took out the full delta, the, about eighty thousand dollars, the budget would be a three point two one percent increase right now. And you say there's still some flux. How much flux? Do you yeah. Have? So I, I mean, there's there's so many line items in the budget, and you know there's certain things that departments are asking for that you know obviously important to each of them, mm -hmm. and it's a matter of taking those comprehensively and looking at it, and that's what that's what we're doing as as a management team right now and a finance team and um that's what will come to you to continue to scrutinize and um bring you to a comfort level uh that will would uh eventually be the adoption of uh the new budget that would go to the voters is the pension increase because of the new contracts uh it, it it's mainly due to some uh, the, the increases that we had in staffing with fire last year, so we have a couple of additional people, uh, and the, uh, the VMERS increase for this year. So it's both the South Burlington Pension Program, which is currently closed now. There'll be no more additional employees going into that. Um, so over, over the next five to 10 years, we'll start to see a decrease in, in what the, S, the SEI um, pension dollars would require, uh, but new employees would be going into VMERS, and I think I think that's an 11 percent contribution this year. It's different based on non-public safety and public safety. Which which begs the next question, since we have a block of money with SCI, right, yeah. and we'll have a smaller block but a growing block with VMERS, right. what schedule does the state treasurer have for informing their clients about? the progress of their own pension plans how, how do they manage do you know how they manage that yet or we, I know get, we get quarterly you know updates from from SEI right uh, we do yes we don't receive that from Beamers I know that each of our employees receive an annual sheet um, a summary sheet uh, and is that something that we would be that it, I don't I, know what the normal protocol is for that yeah because they're you know they're not I'll, a private client. I'll look in you to know. see if we can get somebody from Beamers to come in, Tim. Or just, or yeah. just find out what they're, what do they yep. do with other clients? Because we don't know. Right? So, because our money's going there, we want to know that they're treating it right and what their sure. strategy is. And, Absolutely. But we can't yeah. tell them what to do with the money. That's correct. That's maybe that's, that's the different. Whole difference is different that from it disappears our, into a black hole and then, you know. Yeah, it's very different <laughs> from the plan we have with SEI. Okay. So we don't well, maybe we could anticipate better. They're on the wrong road. <laughs> right. 
Thank you. Any other comments, questions? All right, thank you. Um, well, our public hearing on the capital improvement plan is scheduled for 7.30, so why don't we um, flip down to number nine, is that okay? And this is the possible continuation of the budget discussion and potential March ballot items and council discussion. And the March ballot item conversation is something that I suggested or requested um, from Kevin, because I, I wanted to get a sense. I'd had some questions from people who were looking at um, wanting to put different ballot items for additional money um, on the ballot and wanted to know um, were, were we in a place where the council was thinking positively about having, um, you know, sense for um, open space or um, what else is out there? Um, is there anything else? No, it's just that. And I, I guess I wanted to have a, um, a thought. I mean, I'm sensing that maybe not at this point because we're looking at 3.73 um, and we'd really hoped that the increase would be three or under but I'm I'm just looking for some feedback and of course we don't know what the school's gonna uh, come up with and when will we know? I don't even know the timeline for that do you the January tomorrow night they're they're meeting they're meeting Wednesday yeah. I think their first run through the budget might be Wednesday so I think because of that, it's premature for us to really make that decision. Um, that makes it very difficult, I might add, for us to really think about our budget <laughs> if we don't know what they're doing till mid-January. Um, when do we have to have our budget done? January 20th, right? What's right. The, when do we have to decide about our own ballot items? Oh, January 20th? The 21st, 21st? Is, is our second meeting in January. That's a Tuesday because of Martin Luther King holiday. And we have to finalize it that night. We're going to see it for the first time on the 13th and have the public meeting. You can set additional time if you want, Tim, for another special meeting. Or you can utilize the 21st, but we ha by the end of the night of the 21st, by our charter, we're required to send it to the school district for the steering committee meeting, which I think is proposed for the 22nd. That I, you know, I can't remember. Did we, did we schedule that? Maybe. I think it's on the budget calendar. So I'll just say, since the school ballot is going to have, or the ballot is going to have a school bond item, I support another penny for open space, but I don't support asking this March. I, I think pushing it to August or even the uh, November election, 2020, we've got three ballots, three votes, elections that are already going to happen. I, I just, I feel like we owe the school board, and this community, the right to just have the conversation about this very big question of the school bond. So I don't support putting it on the March ballot. One advantage to having it in November of next year is you will get a very high turnout. Yes. I'm, I'm theorizing. <laughs> I don't know that for a fact, but I think we had a pretty large turnout in 2016, if I remember correctly, and I, I would say we probably have. So the more turnout you have, the better it is sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Is that, do we agree with that? That you, for an issue like two pennies, right, to add to the tax for open space, you would want a large number of voters to come out and, and voice their, to give their vote on that. I think that was nice for the TIF as well as for the library, community center. Um, mm -hmm. Pennies for, for any, that was in the August. summer, August. end of summer, August. That was a special one, right? Yeah. 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 That was the primary. primary. Yeah. Yeah. But I believe that TIF and the library, community center were on those big dates. All right. Well, I, I don't disagree. I think I am just sort of bemoaning the fact that even with our deliberations on the budget we're still um, you know have to kind of be aware of what the school 
I mean, in, on Wednesday of this week, they are going to look at their budget, which is different than the bond for the school. And I don't know where that is. I, I think they've agreed upon a um, their contract with the teachers or not. Is that final they yet? Update. They keep they meeting. I mean, they're also they updating on that on Wednesday night. Yeah, so I don't know if that's a fait accompli or if they're still... That's with the health care, too, right, with the state health care yeah, plan. Yeah, yeah. They, but the state doesn't have its yield number yet, right? I mean, it's own, its own head tax rate number? The, the, uh, sec or the commissioner of taxes wrote his letter to the legislature uh, noting a 6%. Right. If things were the way they are, yeah. stay the way they were, right? Yeah. Unless Governor Scott reaches into a black bag and pulls out another $22 million or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Like he basically has for the last two years, you know, from some other source, so. So if you're looking at a 6% ed tax rate, right, with a school budget that's, we don't know what it is. Grow a little, But it probably. probably will grow some, right? And then if there's a bond issue on top of that. And our own 3% or whatever it is. And are they trying to go to March for, the, for this bond vote? Yeah, my understanding is that's what they want. Well, I think uh, there hasn't been any real discussion or hint so far as to how much that's going to cost the average taxpayers. A lot of conjecture, but they haven't they haven't right. put out any numbers yet. And I think it's I think it's most unfortunate that posing spending a couple of hundred million bucks um, and taking it down right to the wire before they let folks know how much that's likely to cost. So we don't know that. Right. Um, we don't have the final report on the open lands yet, but we should shortly, and we'll have a better picture there of of what the open space committee recommends and what their priorities are that they recommend. Mm -hmm. And then we should be able to take a look at that and think, well, you know, this is likely to get developed soon. We, we better, if we don't do anything, maybe we better take some action or not. Who knows? And, um, and we don't have a final number on the recreation facility yet. And uh, we'll have that sometime in, in January. But there's an awful lot that we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we can make responsible decisions for the March ballot with everything that we don't know. And if the state indeed is looking at 6% education increase and we're looking at a three percent general budget increase the school proposes this and we propose other things i can tell you i think i think people are going to rebel and say that's enough we're not paying any more taxes screw you and um and we don't want to get into that bind either so so we're kind of in a tough spot we may have to hold off on on most of this until we can make responsible decisions and i think the school board has not been responsible in uh and, and following through with this in a timely manner so that people have a real specific idea of what they're going to be asked to decide on right until the very last minute. I think that's very unfortunate. Well, I'm certainly oh, there. feeling the, the pressure just on our own budget. You know, do you really, I mean, is 7.21 okay? It may not be for if there's a really enormous increase on the school side, whether it's there whether they can change it or not. Um, yes, Michael. Uh, just for the few members of the public, anyway, yeah. Um, Michael Bittag, I live in South Burlington, I'm a resident and taxpayer. W which of all the one, uh, items that you're considering for the ballot, obviously the city's budget, uh -huh. the school budget. Yes, um, it, the school bond probably. Well, the, the bond is a, okay, the school well, bond. Well, I mean, they. Yeah, the recreation bond. The sense for conservation proposal. Is there anything else? At this point, not that I know of. Not there the certainly has bond. been. Big one? Not, not the recreation bond. Yeah, oh, we're that's, not. That's, that's going to be done later. We've already agreed to put that off. Okay. Well, Michael, the only essentials are the school budget and the city budget. Yeah. Everything else. I would say that can wait. The, uh, the sense for conservation is also quite uh, important because. Uh, land is being used up which which you as a council might uh, accept recommendations from the open space committee to conserve so anxiously looking forward to seeing that final report that's for yeah. sure yeah. i think what i'm hearing the sentiment is until we get some of that that final information it's yeah. a little hard for us to commit to um supporting any additional um ballot item that raises taxes yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure how you, you by March you can be comfortable enough with a 209 million dollar 
bought it. That's not us. Not but that's out. not us. That's out of our control. It's out of your control as to whether it goes on the ballot or not. Correct. Is it out of your control for us to find out what it might cost the taxpayer? Well, well, go ahead and ask them. We, we, Beg your pardon? Go ahead and ask them. We've asked. We don't have answers. Well, they're getting the answers, and yeah. it's taking them longer than they had anticipated. I mean, I'm not opposed to paying taxes, but um, I've, my personal opinion is this is gilding the lily. Uh, we don't live in Los Gatos here. All right. One, one comment I have is, um, you know, um, budget cycle after budget cycle, there are always these this is a single summary sheet, which is really helpful for the to the, the voters, right, uh -huh. and to the taxpayers that summarize for a $300,000 house, for a X $100,000 condo, whatever it is, right? But my question is, how many times has anybody gone back and measured whether what we said it was going to be was pretty darn close to what it ended up That's being? That's a good question. Our auditor. Yeah. <laughs> well, the year. auditor doesn't look at that. The and auditor just looks at the, at the budget. Right, but, at the end. So I'm, I'm just curious because, no, you know, they, you they go, our, our best, you know, based upon our yeah. numbers and projections and the grand list, blah, 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 right, it'll be, you know, $400 extra per year for this. But we never we never find out if that actually, I mean, I guess you could wait for a, for a taxpayer to go, I just got my bill and it was more than. <laughs> so the biggest ways to measure that, Tim, is what the actual growth in the grand list ends up being. For every year I've been here, except for last year, the grand list growth actually was higher than what was projected, so the tax rate actually went down. This past year, for this fiscal year budget in 20, because of those major adjustments that were made, a couple with the hotels and the Lowe's mm -hmm. uh, building and parking area, um, we lost a significant amount in the grand list. So the grand list um, slightly went down um, this past year for 20. And um, so that's, that's one major measurement. The second measurement that is um, what we have left at the end of the year. Did we manage the budget properly? Was there money to, at least some money to put on the balance sheet, but did, at least, did we at least come out in a, in a, with a positive number? We've always come out with a positive number. I think we can all agree we wish we could have put more on the balance sheet too, but at least the, the budget has been managed in a way that it's never run a deficit. And then the third measurement, really to validate everything, is the audit that we get. And Ron will be doing that for fiscal year 19 at our meeting in January on the 21st. But does the, does the, the audit probably doesn't include, you know, a measurement of what was projected on those summary sheets versus what actually happened? And when we get the budget book, we see we see what the budget was, yep. line item by line item, no, and on, actual spent. No, I, on the one sheet so it says so on the three hundred thousand dollar house and on the one hundred fifty thousand condo, this is what your tax bill difference will be. The but and there is a caveat there. And you that, want the definitive answer, was it? it and right. you want an, I want I always curious. The following year, yeah. were they was that projection correct, or how how inaccurate, or how accurate was yeah. it? I, I I got you. We can we can get some of that data, and I can show that. I don't want to strain so. the yeah, the I, process for that, now. but it's yep. and the other problem is that you're going to have to cherry pick, you know, values off the grand list where there are no, um, you know, property tax, uh, you know, uh, reductions or, or. You know, where, where the property tax is, is, is diff it's different because of the income, right? right. Sensitivity. So oh, right. you've got to, you've got to pick those. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just. But you're saying on the average, did we? You'd have to be on the average. Yeah. Right? Well, but, but it doesn't matter about whether you get the homestead because you're, the value of your home, whatever it is for that tax period, and what is um, the tax um, adjustment li liability. Oh would come out, with, should come out as, you should be able to do the arithmetic that says for a two hundred and fifty or $350,000 condo, um, the increase was what we projected, $400. Now, you may not pay that, right. but the projections would be, that's what you're talking about, are the right. projections accurate? Because it's right. too complicated to factor in who gets what as a um, 
reduction because well, of well, the, but they well, know who gets adjustment. a property tax adjustment. So the question is for people that didn't get property tax adjustments, and they they said for the for the four hundred thousand dollar house, expect a four hundred and forty four dollar increment. Is that what they got? That's my and the same for the so. for the lower price condos. I think Tom's point earlier about we adjust the tax rate, the tax rate set um, in June, late June, after we get um, mm -hmm. the numbers from the mm -hmm. state, mm -hmm. and where we create a projected tax rate to take to the voters to let them know that, mm -hmm. but that's corrected in June, and as Tom points out, every year except last. The number actually got better, mm -hmm. so it's a pretty good projection mm -hmm. as to what the taxpayer actually ends up paying. Well, we it's might exact as to what the taxpayer ends up. I paying. suspect that it's it is pretty good because I don't hear people yelling that they thought the projection. Yeah, you was told me it was only going to be two hundred, and right, it turned it out to be five hundred or whatever. But with with over fifty percent of the properties in the city getting a property tax adjustment, sometimes it's hard to to calculate that accurately. I would think. Yeah. So. I mean, we can measure the municipal side of things. The the property tax rebate stuff. I, th I I don't know if that's considered confidential information or it, 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 it is accepted and it's in your hands. <laughs> Michael and then Roseanne. The both numbers on, are shown on uh, on, the, on our tax bills. If you if you're going to get a, an, in, um, an income sensitivity mm -hmm. discount, it shows as well as the the gross number. So if you're going to be looking backwards, if you want to look back you'll see both numbers, so it doesn't matter whether somebody got an income sensitivity allowance. Roseanne? Um, as, as you're delivering this, and I know it's a very complex issue, um, you know, about pushing off, and I'm talking about the, the sense for conservation, uh -huh. uh, pushing it off to November. <clears throat> my concern is that things are going up all the time, and my guess is something will be on the ballot for November that could conflict with it. So I'm not confident that pushing it down the road will make it a better uh, opportunity. But um, but the bigger issue is um, interim zoning. So at Tuesday's Planning Commission meeting, the chair of the IZ uh, Open Space Committee gave their report to the Planning Commissioners. Um, and, and I forget, out of a thousand parcels or... Uh, 183. Uh, what was it? 183. 183. Well, he, he was going about all of the land, then he, he pared it down, and, and he pared it down to 100. And, that they, I think he had a list of about 25 parcels or so. Um, and when we gave our presentation, we were giving a, just a rough estimate, assuming there are this many acres, which was roughly equivalent to what we thought they were going to come out with, at, at, a, at the market rate, you know, it was $10 million. And that's how we, we projected the, the, the increase, uh, or what you would need, if the council would decide. So this is the issue. So. The report is pretty much done. He's like crossing T's and dot and I's, and I guess I'm going to bring it to you. So then what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. um, unless you intend to do some major rezoning in order to preserve the land or other methods, which I can't imagine what you would do in a timely fashion, mm -hmm. the council had come up with, so, so what? Now we... And this is not the first time, as you know, that we've had committees and, and actually hired consultants to come up with what land do we want to preserve. And over and over again, they have the land you want to preserve and why. Now you're going to have another listing. What are you going to do? <laughs> you know, I, I, you know. Well, but even if so, I mean, this is an out. I mean, an out. This is a, um, a follow on to the actions you might want to take should you want to preserve some or all of those parcels. Otherwise, what are you going to do to preserve them? So, you know, um, I don't know if you are reluctant to put the sense for conservation on the ballot because you support it and you want it to pass, and you think it won't pass because of other budgetary um, mm -hmm. constraints, or if you are worried that the budget will pass because the the sense for conservation is on there because you support both of them. But in reality, you don't have to support the sense for conservation. The voters will vote on that or not. Uh, I, I, I don't. No, I. I, I don't know your re reluctance. Appreciate so, yeah. your comments, and I, and I appreciate your letter that you sent to mm -hmm. us. Megan, do you have a yeah? Comment? I just wanted to say that I think. Um, 
it is important for this March, I, that's my personal opinion, um, for it to be dedicated to the school bond book. Um, I think that we made that commitment when we decided to hold off on the recreation center. But I am not wed to the idea that this needs to be, a, that we need to wait till November to hold a future vote. Um, so I just want to put that out there. Yeah. Well, don't we have a primary vote in August this year? Or not? We do. Do we have anything else before that? Or is it March, August, November? March, August, November. So there's, so there's, there a, there's an August in there. But Roseanne, your, your point is very well taken. I think, I think every one of us supports preserving the open land. Um, I think most of us want the recreation facility as well. Um, I think, I, I had a talk with John Simpson a week or maybe 10 days ago, and he said he had some ideas and thoughts as to how we might be able to acquire some of this land without, without taxation write-off. And, and I, he didn't get into details because we didn't have the time, but I think we need to explore whether there are other options for acquiring land that we want to preserve. I made it very clear <coughs> to Alan Strong, and I think that's who must have made your pre presentation. Oh, yeah, he's chair at the Open Space. Right, yeah. and he's, you know, he's right around the corner from me on, the, on campus in the same building. Um, you know, I said, we're, not, we're not doing this, not, not doing anything, we're going to do something. So the question is exactly what and when and exactly how we're going to do it. But I think, uh, I think speaking for myself and hopefully for the others, we're, we're committed to doing something and making sure that, that we don't let this, I mean, that's the purpose, that was the purpose of the whole IZ thing. So let's, right. let's, let's make some progress here, absolutely. Now, and so I, I, I want you to are. be assured yes. That, yes. that we're on the same page, that we want to do it in a fashion that accomplishes what we want to accomplish without having to tax if we don't have to tax and, and being timely so that if we do, we, we get the votes we need and make things happen. Well, I appreciate the council's dedication to prevent friends and frustration. This council generally seems interested in, in doing that. And um, I'm sure that we were just trying to, in that presentation, show you the various ways of doing it, conservation easements and you know, donations and all that. Um, it just seems most of them are a hard thing to do in a short period of time. And as we've done in the past, if you don't have something in place when IZ ends, you know what happened the last time. You're not going to have that land available you know, perhaps next Absolutely, year. For sure. It's going to be all encumbered as mm -hmm. what happened last time. So that's. And that says of urgency to have something in place before you end IZ. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that, and I think you understand where we are. It's um, now time to warn a uh, public hearing for public comment consideration and possible improvement or amendment to the capital improvement plan. So I'd entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. We are now in um, a public hearing. Is there anyone um, from the public? Do you want to go? We probably ought to go through what changes we made and then open it up to the public. Sure. Yeah. Um, Is there anyone here to specifically comment on the CIP? Okay. <laughs> well, so just to review, we, ha we had a um, special meeting on Wednesday night upstairs, and uh, the council heard from the various department heads. I didn't have them come back tonight because I think we, um, I think we ended at, at a pretty good place. But uh, we did make some changes in, in terms of what was proposed, and I think we ended up with two hundred and eleven thousand dollars above what last year's appropriation to the CIP was. <clears throat> so originally, um, if we started at with the DPW budget. <clears throat> We had um, considered a uh, million dollars worth of paving and landed at $750,000 with the potential for Justin, I believe, to uh, be able to apply for a $160,000 grant through the state <clears throat> that would give us some additional funding dollars for paving. Um, his fleet was proposed at 250 dollars and that was left. The garage expansion, which is the second year for uh, of that project, uh, at forty thousand dollars was left. The removal of the infected ash trees <clears throat> was originally budgeted for two hundred thousand dollars, and Justin 
talked about uh, how the actual cost of the trees and the replacing of them has been much less than what he originally projected. And we cut that from 200 to $100,000 worth of work for fiscal year 21. <coughs> In the fire and ambulance, we had <coughs> um, a Oh, yep. Do we know what kind of trees you're going to use? The a variety of trees. Yeah. It, it, Replacing they're, they're actually the ash in, with a variety. This, so deciduous, evergreen, I mean. I think we'll yeah. be using the arborists as a um, source of recommendations and follow those. So we're going to use some expertise. Well. Yeah. We're not just going to the. <laughs> Okay. You know, gardener supply end of the year sale. I just wanted to be sure you're not just going for the cheapest tree and that's how you've got the hundred thousand dollars worth. No, we're doing fewer trees. And that we think they will cost less. Fewer trees this year. This year, right. yes. We're gonna do all of them right. eventually, but fewer this year. Thank you. Yeah. Part of the savings, Michael, was the cost in taking them down. Uh, Tom, I don't know if you want to comment on that at all, but I think there were six or seven different types of trees that have been identified as replacements for yeah. the for the ash. I'm satisfied. You're good. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Enough. Let's keep going. Um, fire equipment. Uh, the proposed ten thousand dollars in, in um, that was maintained. Fifty-nine thousand uh, dollars worth of fit up in station two to the upstairs living quarters there. The $216,000 to the communications <coughs> tower, that's an annual payment that we have for the bond. Nothing I, changed there. I, I would just note the 10,000 for the uh, CO. fire CO equipment was the CO um, re-filling um, our tanks. And there's, uh, this would buy two, <coughs> I think, This or is one. the testing equipment. The <coughs> testing equipment, but we could also work with other communities we could fill their tanks for them we could fill their tanks and charge them, them. And test them and charge them so yeah. there's a potential to maybe make a little money and he also talked about an opportunity to go for a grant mm -hmm. that might pull in ninety thousand dollars with using this maybe as but, a, but it was more for training than it was for capital stuff is that did he say that you know i can't remember but anyway it just was a sort of a positive yeah. note, I thought. <clears throat> uh, under the police station, the, the financing of the debt service, service the 66000 is the interest payment. The, the principal comes out of the local options tax. Uh, the vehicle replacement was reduced. Um, I believe the original m amount was uh, 180 and we took out one cruiser. So the 126 um, is able to get them three replacement vehicles and fit up, uh, which includes one of the vehicles being their SUV. The security and building access equipment, uh, Sean talked a little bit about this on Wednesday night. Um, it's, it, the original equipment came with the building and it's, they can no longer store that kind of footage uh, and some of the cameras have already needed working, replacement. Yeah. So the technology is just uh, out of date and the cameras are failing. Uh, so they're replacing the, um, the building security equipment. The communications, computers, and electronics was originally at 98. It's been cut to $76,000. And that's because they're gonna purchase the fingerprint machine out of this year's budget which is $22,000. Uh, recreation parks, uh, nothing changed other than moving the bleacher replacement out one year into fiscal 22. That was for $10,000. But other projects planned there include Overlook Park, uh, improvements to Overlook at 35,000, improvements to Szymanski at 20,000, which I think included uh, converting that over to pickleball. Uh, $120,000 is, is currently in there for the Wheeler House. Uh, we expect to have a proposal this week from Red Lion Construction on exactly the breakdown of those costs, Tim, as you asked for it. And as soon as we have that, we'll, we'll send that out to you. And that's largely for the roof. 
which yes. is failing. It, there's a his, there's some safety the, issues. Some of the yeah, some of the shingles, the slate shingles are coming and off. And the underpinnings are will need to be replaced. Off. A lot of the boards underneath will need to be replaced. And this company that's giving are they giving a quote for the work? Uh, yeah, uh, an estimate an in estimate. terms of how much are we just to, so we could refine the price a little bit better. So it's like a pre-estimate estimate. Yeah, or? it would it would it'd be a pretty good ballpark, but it wouldn't be an exact. But it, but it's not actually a result of an RFP though. No, no, okay. no. We, we we wouldn't do that until it got approved. Then okay. we would go out on an RFP and get at least three right. quotes for the work. But the, are they being paid to give this estimate? No, no, they're doing it for free. No. Okay, thank you. This one twenty, we came up with that figure uh, uh, through Adam at Public Works. Yep. In, in conversation with some people that do roofing. He's met several roofers up there, but this is the first kind of detailed quote that we'll get other than a kind of eyeballing what, what people think it might cost. So there are we're trying to hone in on that. A lot of valleys on that roof. <laughs> yes. Um, $60,000 worth of improvements up at the basketball courts at Veterans and a $30,000 cost for replacement of the Brecken Park's truck uh, vehicle. The only other change was we uh, decreased the amount of the city center reserve fund proposed at 860 and dropped that to $750,000 based on what our current debt obligation is, which is around 735,000. So. Okay. Any comments or additional thoughts? We had a good meeting the, uh, last week mm -hmm. where we really were able to discuss this. <coughs> so I'm fine with everything that was just laid out here. I, I do have an additional thought on the Performing Arts Center. Yes. We'll that conversation now or outside of the public hearing. It doesn't matter. Um, I think we can have it now. So again, I'm supportive of all of this. I just, I, when I look at page 54 of our packet, which is page 96 of the set, I, I just don't see the Performing Arts Center as um, having made its place onto that list. I have not heard the Wrecking Parks Committee. I have not heard a committee appointed South Wales residents not the facility study, which, uh, again, there are specific concerns about that was in it. So I, I would just say it best to just take that off. It can still be a conversation to have, but right now I see that more as a, as a wish list, and this is a capital improvement plan and, and not a capital improvement wish list. And if we're going to keep it on there, then I'd like to put a pool on there. But uh, uh, again, I don't think we need either <laughs> one of those things because they just they haven't gone through there, but the pool has been much more thoroughly vetted over the 30 plus years, and I, I just, I can't vote for the SIP with this $30 million Performing Arts Center in there two years out when the high school is also going to have, a, if it gets passed, which I'm going to vote for it, um, is going to have a brand new auditorium and then also a black box area. So that's my statement. I'm not here, I'm not going to debate you guys because I'm not going to change any minds, but just I can't support this with that performing arts. You know, I, I think it could be stripped pretty easily and you could add it back very easily in the future too. I had forgotten about that. It was easy to not pay attention to because we haven't talked about it at all since a presentation, what, a year ago now? Something like that? Mm -hmm. and, and it's still, it's still, I'm not looking at it right now. Is it still in the... Fiscal year 23 and fiscal year 24. For, for how much? 30. 28. Yeah, I think, I think there's enough going on right now and enough unknowns, and the school wants to focus on arts as well. I would tend to agree with Tom. I don't think it's something we should be uh, focused on right now. I, I just, I, I forgot it was in there, quite honestly. I, I don't. Other we, thoughts? We haven't talked about it at all. No, what are the consequences of taking it off of the ledger? And it can always be put back on by the same kind of a consensus. I think that's all we need really for that item, which is separate for the resolution tonight, which is just for next year. But um, in terms of Tom's point, if there's consensus among the council, that we can just take it off. If it comes to a point again where there's growing interest for it and it the council sure. decides to put it back on, it can be put back on. Yeah, we can't just, just toss a place everything on that might, it's, it's got to be stuff that's got more substance to it. Yeah, and I think at the time well, it, it, at the time it, it went on, it, it did. did. It, 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 yeah. so, it did at I mean, one point. It wasn't point. just a, a wish. No. There was some real, in a city. yeah. Right. But right now, I don't, I don't think it's it's 
called for it to, or appropriate to, to leave it there. It give people I kind of false. Don't forget, false like in probably a year or less, there will be an open two big stage area on Williston Road. Former Showcase 5, right? Oh, right. Former Higher Ground is going to be vacant. It has two stages. Well, that's that's true. Is yeah, you that got a Sears there to too. Keep it on or take it off? No, I, I I'm not advocating either way. I'm just I was just thinking forward about open space that would be available for something that you know that right. people a are talking about. Different kind of open space than yeah. we were talking about before. But <laughs> well, just to make it clear, it's, it's open a stage space. Open, space. Space. open stage. Open, open stage. stage space. Yeah. Well, but I mean, I, I, go ahead. You do make a point that the Sears property will be empty. That's a huge piece of property. And if you read what's happened in other malls across the country, arts have been integrated and amusement parks have been integrated. Libraries. And right. Library, you know, so there is, so anyway, my, I, I think that's an interesting point. Let's, I would hope maybe we can take that off and we put it back on sometime if it's, if it's more timely. Can we do that? Where, yes, we can. Yeah, because this was a public-private discussion, as I recall. So, okay. We're just put asterisks on every number. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, are there any other comments from the public or? Yes. I have a comment not on any of the numbers you presented, but as a member of the public, I have no idea what Tom is talking about if I right. don't see it on the screen. Right. And with a pointer. So uh, every, everything's <coughs> on the website. It's been on the website for page ninety-six. Two, yeah. two months. Of the CIP. Now. Got it. Um, okay. Page ninety-six. It, of the, CIP. the effort tonight was to keep it simple, just for the resolution. <laughs> well, that would, for me, that it, would keep it simple. So the resolution <laughs> is just for what they're approving next right. year, Michael. It's not and, the, and the just the not a ten-year plan. It's just okay. what is what money is going into, and and just for the public watching, just to be clear. What's being voted on tonight is what the council perceives at this time, because this could still change again right. uh, when they finalize the budget for this year. Mm -hmm. What the council's approving is what they believe tonight is a reasonable funding of major projects, more than $10,000 in value for the next fiscal year, which would be fiscal year 21. So that's what the resolution is. And if you approve this tonight, it does not lock you into anything. You can still come back on January 13th and say, you know, I got thinking about X, and I don't really think we need to do that right now, and it can be changed. But it's, it's required by the way things are set up with our charter, with the CIP, and um, the amendment allows us to at least move forward with a proposal to include these items in your proposed draft budget, and that's really, <coughs> that's really yeah, the I intent tonight. Response to, it may be on the website, but a lot of people have difficulty navigating a website. Yep. Find, yep. I think so I'll give you this. I know, I can do it. Okay. I'm, I'm not one yep. of those people. <laughs> I can Please. navigate it. But just as a, as a courtesy to, well, there are not many people here tonight, <laughs> but if there were, it would be good for them to see it, that what, what it is you've, you're talking about, you just put a highlight on a pointer, uh, that would be a good way well, to Does anybody want my copy? Because yeah. I do. Play we, have done, we have done draft. that. Yeah. So if you go back to prior meetings, it, I, I it, it's on there. I'm talking there. about tonight. When you talk about uh, this $10,000 here, this particular $10,000, yep. for others who haven't read it or haven't gone to the website, it's just a courtesy. And it would be very, it would be very good. That's a, for the help, that's helpful to it's helpful to hear. It's it's hard from our our perspective sometimes to just kind of sort out how much is too much information for people to to kind of take in. But I appreciate your comment, Michael. And we can make sure that happens next time. Can we post this? Um, it, it, like, it is on there. It is. Yeah. Yeah. But we, okay. Yeah. We'll make it front and center. Okay. Thank you. You know, Roseanne, in line, with, in line with that, you know, you send out your packet and it's all here in the agenda. I mean, if you remember to, to bring, you know, you're going to print out hundreds, some pages. Um, but it would be nice maybe to have it just projected up there. I mean, if I could plug in, I could just project this for the people that didn't bring their iPads or, you know, when you're talking about these kind of details, unless you see something. Sure. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. Okay. We can, we'll do better. 
at our next budget. Make decision. sure that happens. Yeah. <coughs> All right, so we need to vote on this, Helen. correct? Oh, we have to come out. Move to come out. David, do you have a comment? No. I have a compliment to make. Oh. I'm really impressed as a past town manager for all the information that the staff and the council goes through and ferrets out this stuff. It, it's not an easy task, and it really just, I wanted to just note that, that you folks and the staff that get together and do this, it's commendable we have that going on in this. Thank well, you. Thank you. Yeah. The reports desist, they don't come together automatically. So thank you. Yes, it's a team team effort. A lot of a lot of folks on that one. So thank thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion to come out of the um, public hearing. All in favor? Aye. 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 So then I would then entertain a motion to what tentatively approve this? Well, did we take the did we take the arts thing out of it? So was, we're, the resolution yeah. is just for, for next tonight. year. Yeah, just oh, just for next year. Further out, and, we, and we'll remove that. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. I, I'll move that we approve the capital improvement plan for next year. Second. Okay, with the caveat that it can be changed if we get yeah. into uh, further budget discussions and need to find some additional sure. dollars, in our opinion. Um, so we have a motion to approve and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And thank you, Tom, for all your work. Yeah. Okay, moving on to number 10. Possible executive session to receive advice from legal counsel regarding the appeal of ANR Wetlands General Permit 3-9026 with the Vermont Superior Court Environmental Division Docket number 142-12-18. Good evening, Andrew Bullock, City Attorney. Help yourself to cookies, too. You're welcome. Tom <laughs> Street, yeah. Town of Petro Public Works, uh, Stormwater. Um, so I have on the agenda is a, uh, is a possible executive session. Mm -hmm. um, uh, council was provided with a significant number of settlement, settlement documents that went to council only, as, as well as a uh, confidential memo provided by our outside council to outline the terms of the settlement. Um, I think the executive session is on the agenda in case council wants to get into any discussion about the, <coughs> the likelihood of success or we're not to settle. Um, otherwise, I don't, I'm not certain a executive session is necessary, but I wanted it to be on the agenda just in case. Okay. Discussion. Um, and uh, with that said, I think we start to go through some of the some of the details, and Tom is here to talk about some of the bullet points. This uh, the state. <coughs> issued its wetland general permit last, uh, last November, um, and so a little over a year ago, um, Tom had been engaged in discussions with the state providing comments on that general permit, um, and the state issued it without any consideration of the number of South Burlington concerns. Um, uh, so the city appealed that decision and appealed it with the town of Williston. Um, we hired outside counsel um, and coordinated the appeal between the two municipalities. Um, settlement discussions have occurred over the last year, a lot of exchange of documents, um, and the end result is, uh, is what was provided. Um, overall, I think the city got a number of the things on its wish list, not everything on, on its wish list, but certainly got a lot more um, than it had been trying to get prior to the issuance. Um, so we want to go through some of the kind of additional reasons, kind of the things, Tom, that weren't in the uh, the general permit, as well as kind of what, what the city was able to get. Sure. Yeah. So to back up just slightly, um, we have a lot of stormwater work to do in South Burlington, as you all well know. And uh, implementation and construction of those projects is many times frustrated uh, by permitting, uh, specifically wetlands permitting. So before this permit was even issued, we had provided comments to DEC on a number of occasions about how their requirements to do stormwater work and their requirements for floodplains or wetlands or rivers or whatever it might be, sort of they, they weren't in sync. Um, and so we'd expressed those concerns and DEC issued this permit uh, specifically for water quality work, but unfortunately it missed the mark in our opinion. It set a very low threshold, so everything required a permit. It wasn't clear in many cases. Um, and 
having provided comment over years, we felt the only way we could move forward here was by an appeal of this permit. So that's what South Burlington Williston did, because um, we have a great amount of stormwater work relative to some of the other communities, but certainly other communities kind of supported our viewpoints and our comments here as well. Um, so do you want me to get into what we, we've gained in the end here? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think one of the most important things we gained is we got in a room with a number of folks at DEC and our concerns were heard by legal staff, not just Wetlands Division, so that was important as well. Um, and I think we're understood in many ways. Uh, we clarified an allowed use. Uh, that's kind of a way of saying maintenance and repair. So we didn't want to have to get a permit every time we go out to fix something. Uh, and so that wasn't especially clear, so that's now much more clear in the permit. Uh, there's an impact threshold for this permit. Uh, it was at 5,000 square feet. We got that slightly increased to 7,000 square feet of wetland impacts uh, before we would need to get a permit. Uh, another, it's kind of an inside baseball thing, um, but there's many clarifications here, but how the avoidance criteria, so if you're going to impact a wetland, you have to first minimize, then try to avoid. If you have a single piece of property and you need to avoid wetlands, you go and you look on your property and say, I've tried to avoid it, I, I can't, or I can't put my project over here. When you're a city and they say to avoid, they don't, haven't been looking just at that piece of property. They say, go find that project somewhere else in the city, which effectively means you, you have a very difficult time proving that you can't do a project anywhere when it's a, for treating a specific parking lot, for example. Um, so we've got them to put some guardrails on that so we all understand how they're going to do that analysis so we can move things forward. Um, I, I think those are, those are the big highlights. I guess if there's any questions, I'll go from there. So, so this essentially broadens the general world. So there will be uh, more city projects that can move forward um, without having to go through the process for the wetlands division uh, to obtain a permit prior to initiating a stormwater project, which ultimately improves the entire public And South Burlington is a, uh, our stormwater division is a, is a, is a leader. And so as Tom mentioned, a lot of municipalities look to us to kind of carry this Well, it sounds like they respected your position because you've earned that respect and, and you were raising good issues. It wasn't a frivolous kind of you know, pushback on bureaucracy. It's a lot of long conversations, but, uh, but we got, had some good games. So did, so did the state more learn about this than, than we did? Sorry? Did the state learn more about this renegotiation process than, than the city did? In other words, what, what did the state do wrong in the first place by not having a conversation earlier about what, you, what they wanted you to do versus what you, what you actually practically could do with the regulation they were proposing or whatever it was? I mean, in other words, I mean, you can make a law, but before you make a law, you're, you really should try to understand what the repercussions are. are and, mm -hmm. and, and you're probably the number one customer in the state, right, in terms of, like but we just said. We, we do quite a bit of work. I guess what, it, the reality of um, all the stormwater work that we're required to do by one hand and then how implementation of that work can be frustrated by another hand of the same right. division or, you know. And that's <coughs> it, it's a DEC on both hands? Yes. So do they have two hands that don't talk to each other, or? There's different divisions. So there's a yeah. wetlands and a stormwater okay. division. Um, and so these wetland permits are handled by the wetland division. Right. And while there's certainly some back and forth between and they have them. The same, they have the same high list level manager for the, or they have a management problem where they can't figure out how to talk to each other before they issue regulations. And, other. and I don't want to solve a state bureaucratic problem here, but the question is in the last year, did you help them figure out that they have a problem with the process? That wasn't in the stipulation, yeah. but. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I think, I, I would hope that through this process, more folks at DEC have heard, um, if they want, if this, they want this stormwater work done, and we're required to, um, some of the costs of that, and it may be more impacts to something like a managed wetland buffer. So a managed wetland buffer, for example, is a lawn next to a wetland that maybe an association mows. Um, and so they've been applying, they've been protecting that lawn and rather than maybe let us put in a stormwater treatment practice in that lawn, 
uh, they'd say, nope, go look somewhere else for your project, right? Or you have too much impact here, reduce it. So we go look somewhere else and then we can't find it. Or then maybe we got to build a much more expensive project under a parking lot. Um, so sort of the, the permit they issued didn't really look at the whole picture. It was protecting wetlands um, in a very narrow way, perhaps, in my view. Um, and I think I should help them broaden the net water quality gains here uh, that we all want. This, is, this problem is not unique to the wetlands division. <laughs> I don't tell it is. <laughs> but they're the ones that issued a permit specifically for stormwater projects, so this is, you know. Well, but the good news, even if though it took a year of conversation, you got to a better place. And you know, hopefully that realization and these new, I guess, rules, right, will be applied to other municipalities um, to their benefit. So it just reminds me of a problem I had at IBM. I've been there for two years and I was like, I don't know, 24 years old. And the quality department was monitoring some testing of modules and the modules had to be heated to a certain temperature but the testers so they each had their own spec there was a specification for the testing of the quality modules and there was a specification for the tester itself and they both had temperature ranges right but they didn't agree with each other so that so the auditors would come in and they would write us a ticket essentially for your temperature is too high and I go but this temperature has got to be this for these modules but yeah but that's not the tester temperature and I go you wrote both the specifications no we're writing you a notice and this went on for six months until I called them all in the same room and I said this has got to stop because you know nobody's winning here and uh, they finally changed one of their documents and that took care of the whole problem but it just reminds me of the same type of thing that was just a piece of well, ancient it's not history just government it's it, uh, private it, business it happens well. everywhere it happens right. everywhere so thank you for that reminiscence <laughs> okay so do we need to take an action yeah tim must have the unless there's some other comments or questions second page right, right. so uh, i would like to move that the council approve the proposed settlement of the appeal of ANR Wetlands General Permit 3-9026 and authorize the city manager to execute the settlement agreement and any related documents. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. Great so work, guys. Very good work. Now we have Thanks, a second Thank one, you. right? Oh, it's the same one? How come it's down the for twice? executive session if you need it? Oh, that's right. Okay. Sorry. Great. We're chugging right along here. That's Helen. <laughs> okay, so we can move on to item 12. Um, a little bit ahead of schedule. Yes. Yeah. I'm off that. Receive transfer of development rights interim zoning committee analysis report and discuss possible next steps. So, Bernie, are you and? I don't know. I don't know. Michael can come, sir. And Michael, both of you? Okay. That was a long document you sent us. <laughs> Um, so, let me just, I have two roles here, I'm a planning commissioner, but I'm also the chair of that TDR in terms of zoning. Okay. So, I think I will probably address you as the chair of the uh, TDR in terms of zoning committee and Bernie mm -hmm. for, the, for the commission. Yep. Um, quick background, the report was... Uh, presented to the planning commission in July and to the council on August the 1st, I believe. Um, and since that time, uh, the committee, uh, me as the chairman, have been trying to uh, move ahead by either having the commission accept and approve the recommendations and guide the committee on its next steps and that hasn't happened yet and i guess that's why we're here tonight yep that is so um you were provided a uh, a memo on um essentially where we are as well as the um latest version of the tdr report and uh the gist of 
really the reason why we're here tonight is um, when the TDR committee and Michael presented the, um, the TDR report to the Planning Commission, um, first of all, the Planning Commission thought they did a really good job on it and it's pretty comprehensive with respect to uh, what they looked at and the recommendations. Um, there was a, um, a split in the Planning Commission in terms of uh, what product it was that the City Council was looking for. Um, when we looked at the, um, <coughs> the, um, the language uh, that the City Council provided, um, undertake an analysis of the program and provide recommendations, um, there were several people on the Planning Commission that felt that this report essentially uh, did that. Um, I think it still needs a little bit of review and um, some tweaking of the recommendations, um, but part of the Commission felt that the report met the requirements and the tasking of the City Council. Um, other members of the Planning Commission felt that um, the uh, objective of the City Council was to have um, written regulations by the end of the process. Um, so at that point, um, we felt that it would be a good idea to come in to the Council, um, let you take a look at the status <coughs> where the TDR committee is at and then um, provide some direction as to whether um, you know essentially this is kind of there and we just need to tweak it polish the apple get it done and turn it in or whether there was something a lot more comprehensive that the council was looking for and so um, in our meeting where we discussed <coughs> this we decided to hold off on making any final comments and and moving forward until we got some direction on uh, exactly what the product was that, that you're looking for. And so um, in the memo, the requested feedback, item one is essentially, um, you know, is the report as written meet the direction that you were looking for? Um, and if it does, you know, we'll, we'll move forward with, um, you know, tweaking out the recommendations and stuff. If it doesn't, then um, you know, we'd like a little more guidance on exactly what you're looking for and, um, and you know, prioritization on how to get there, so. Um. Okay. Megan? I would like, once we have the open space report and ideally the earth economics report, um, either bolstering or not bolstering the open space reports, um, recommendations for there to be on your committee your your planning commission committee a discussion of which area should be the receiving areas outside of the southeast quadrant that's what I see as the ultimate outcome and then that would require some changes within the LDRs which is what you're recommending in option four yeah Yes, option four, um, which is the recommend option by the TDR committee, is essentially to expand both the sending and the receiving areas. Um, but um, the question is, is whether to proceed with, you know, writing the regulation before the end of interim zoning. And I would think you're going to have the open. We would be receiving the open space report in January. Mm -hmm. um, Earth economics. We have a smaller job for them to perform could they move that up to february by any chance kevin did you talk uh, about their, their deadline was still february still february so in our end of interim zoning is february right february the 13th. right friday right. i don't know if it's friday but uh, <laughs> that doesn't uh, that doesn't provide uh, time. and time for the planning commission to you could probably tell I'm quite frustrated by this yes. process. Because well, I, unless we extended interim zoning for another month or whatever but, you know, in order to get the LDRs. Because I'm one of those commissioners who believes that the deliverable that this council expected from us were draft LDR regulations or uh, 
draft regulations, which are LDR ready, um, and that's not a small task. Um, identifying or uh, receiving areas and um, and sending areas in in the entire city um, is not a small task, and writing a, a TDR ordinance which doesn't have what I call the fatal flaws of the one we've got uh, is not a small project for legal staff either. Um, and so if we don't start now, well, we can't start now. There's Christmas, there's New Year's. Right, we're in January. People going away, and I'm one of them. I'll be gone you know, January 16th to 29th or something like that. It doesn't leave a lot of... We, ha we would have to get cracking uh, soon if that's the council's will. Separating the discussion about extending interim zoning and just looking at what's before us tonight in your report, I got to say this weekend I spent a fair amount of time with this and I, I was I was looking for a reason to be concerned and then I contacted a lot of people that I go to for advice, previous planning commission chairs and members as well as uh, commercial real estate people and I basically spelled out what I interpreted in the direction and it's really twofold. One, assigning a square footage allocate potentially working out the kinks to a square footage allocation to a dwelling unit and also expanding the sending and receiving areas for t the TDR market program. Both of these are very sensible, so if you're looking for a gauge for me, I think this is the right direction to go in. Uh, the question about whether or not interim zoning needs to be in place for when this gets adopted, that's a conversation that we need to have, but uh, for what you put, put in front of us tonight, I think this moves in the right direction to make the TDR program, I don't know, more thoughtful and to accomplish the goals that are outlined in those. Okay, so I think, you know, what we're looking for is, is you know, does this report with some tweaking on the recommendations meet what you asked for originally? And if it does, then that's the feedback we would provide to the DD, TDR committee and the regulations would then follow sometime later. Tell us yeah. your meeting schedule. I mean... We don't have a meeting schedule because we don't know what's next. That's well, no, 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 but your regular which meeting we schedule. Is this? The Planning Commission? Yes. Tomorrow we're meeting. Tomorrow you'll be meeting. But tomorrow your, is... Your agenda's focused. already set. Yes. On it or not? No. no. It's not. All right. And, and then, then our next meet meeting is second Tuesday in January. Yeah. And have you finished? I'm sorry, Helen. You can Go ahead. you can quiet me. <laughs> have you finished the the uh, PUD regulations, or is that something that you need to absolutely focus on? Since that was. Yeah, that's so we're focusing on that, and I think Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but you provided a a separate memo with a status of. Um, all the different things we're working on. I did. It might have been a little bit buried at the end of the TDR yeah. report, but it, there is a um, status report of each of those. It's a long list. Just it is a long list. Yes. Uh, on a point of order, if you like, there were three items uh, under interim zoning. The PUD project wasn't one of them. Yes, it was. Yes, yes it, was. it was. It was the primary one. Yes, the primary one. that was, was you definitely, one. that was part I, of it. We I, wanted I, you to I, co I, complete that. I stand corrected. Yeah. But it's a, it's a project that's not going to be completed during interim zoning, whereas the other two, open space and TR, could be completed during, uh, open, during interim zoning. And it was my my interpretation of <laughs> the council's uh, brief to us that that's what you expect. And I my fear is if we don't do all it, of it. <laughs> My fear is if we don't do it now, at least on, um, I'll speak for the TDR committee uh, work alone, um, if we don't do it now, we won't get it done. Uh, it'll get, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of things that uh, might have higher priority after. after well, not if, not if the council says, well, you know, interim zoning's over, but we want that done. Yep. Top of your list. Now there's some TDR overlay. Did you the map? I don't know if it's. It's very it's very rudimentary and by not by far not complete. Well, as, as, you, as you mentioned, Megan, we need to wait to see how it lies. You know how it lies with the other yeah. things we're doing. Right. Are uh, there other comments on the recommendation? Can we? The, the recommendations. I tend to agree with Tom, right? But uh, our charge to that committee was not to produce draft 
uh, regulations, it was to produce a report. Right. And I think we have the report with some suggestions for re the way to, to, to move forward with some changes to the LDRs. So that's not going to happen by the end of whatever chapter of IZ we're in right now. But I think the PUD is paramount, and it was paramount at the time that we went into IZ because of the importance of of future projects that they be done with smart growth, right? I disagree with you, but you know, other things have got in the way. Most notably, inclusionary zoning. Uh, it's taken up a lot of the Commission's time, which means that's time we could not spend on the PUD project. So a charge from IZ, from the City Council, was inclusionary zoning? Yeah. Yes. The Council um, asked for it in January of last year, after after interim after zoning was adopted, right. but asked that it be done in parallel. You had a big appetite. Um, and we're working through it. We're bigger than our stomach. I, Always. One more comment I'd like to make on, on something that Bernie said, which is that it requires tweaking. The first page on the, on the memo about interim zoning, I mean about the TER work, uh, was the tweaking. The, the committee asked the commission for some comment and guidance on, on the report that was presented in July, and they eventually produced that one which has got uh, some, um, some of our comments in red. Right, but the commission in the last meeting that we discussed this, there were commissioners that had some additional questions that we're holding off on. So. Well, they haven't, been, they haven't been put to the committee yet. So right, that's the tweaking. So the question I have based on this report, though, is you wanted to have some kind of broker, <laughs> right, in the city um, staff, I'm assuming, to be able to bring the sellers and the buyers together and keep track and how feasible is that? Uh, I, do, I see, I see, I hear crickets. That was one of the key recommendations in the 2007 report too, that yeah. you need to find some brokerage of those with the TDRs who might want that. Well, well that and a map to track. Send just publish push. the availability in the domain. You know, I mean, just publish the availability and let the buyers come. Right, but that that's some work, considerable work, is it not? Uh, it, it depends on what. And we want to map it too. I mean, I don't want TDRs, you know, that are some swamp, being used, sold to, you know, include. I mean, I think it's sort of crazy to have a TDR of land that would could never be developed. Period. And to use that as, oh, we're going to preserve it, and you're going to pay me whatever it is, $10,000, and then you can build some more stuff somewhere else is absurd. I'm not sure I how mean, that if it's billable land, that's different. Yeah, I'm not sure how that registry would come into being, but the TDR program is voluntary. The city might ask landowners to list their TDRs on this registry, which is on the city's website, it would be on the, and open, available to anybody who wants to see what TDRs are available, buyers and sellers alike. Um, but it's not, a, it's not a small task, uh, it's quite a bit of work for, for staff to do that. Um, and, um, you know, but that could be, um, the, the DRB would have access to that, so if someone came in and needed to have TDRs, you could at least look it up, yeah. right, and say, this TDR is not a... You could put TDRs on Craigslist right now if you want to. Or on Craigslist, if you right. want. Sure. There's sure. nothing to forbid you. You can put it on Front Porch Farm and say, I've got 12. I mean, there's obviously been no problem in the past of buyers and sellers meeting for TDRs that have been purchased for the possible future use. Because I haven't heard any complaints from developers saying they can't find them, they don't know who to go to. Have, has anybody heard complaints like that? Yes. Who have you heard that from? From some of the developers that I spoke to, which comments are there uh, in this report, but some of them said it's difficult. It's, it's difficult to find where the TDRs are. Here's something, you go to the records book and find out who owns all the land in the sending areas and you just call them up and say, hey, <laughs> I need 31 units. You want to sell them? I, 
I just, it just boggles my mind how I know the statute requires or, or asks that this type of balance it requires be made. Amendment. Requires that, that, you know, that it, 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 that the buyers and sellers or whatever it is, you know, but. Actually, the statute doesn't say that, but every other city manager or Wait, so it, I spoke to. I thought it did say that. It says you have to have a map. A map. Okay. Well, so you have to have a registry or a bank. Okay. No, right. no, no. But you have to have a map that says this is the acre or the 0.83. Whoever came up with that? That wasn't just an acre. Um, that, that I'm selling. Right? And, it, and I only can sell it once, presumably. But what's, I mean, I know that we haven't yet officially submitted the um, report, the Open Space IC Committee. But the draft is there for all to see. The 2025 parcels are there for all to see. And lining it up to this map is something that we can do, <laughs> knowing that this is a draft, right? And, and just eyeing it, it seems like it will line up pretty well, to be quite honest. And so that's one thing. What I'm the other question I had was with regard to the commercial, which is something I asked long ago and was told that commercial was out of the question. And I don't see in the Vermont statute anything prohibiting us from using TDRs for commercial. And this is something that you brought up, right? The report mentioned that big cities do it for commercial. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, and the people I spoke to in Seattle and Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, they said that they have never heard or seen of a TDR program where you transferred from rural to rural. Yeah, right. Well, this is what we do. that's why we're here, mm -hmm. right? So, um, but, but they always transfer from rural to industrial or rural to residential. Some of them only do uh, commercial because they want to develop a particular commercial campus. And what I see on those transit overlay districts on your map, there's the potential there for going up, right? I, I, I really, I see ways for you to move forward. Now, I, I'm only one counselor, <coughs> but, and I see your list of things to do. Um, it, it involves maybe picking the places that we want as receiving and the places that we want as sending might be the simpler of the tasks ahead of us because once you've done that, uh, there are zoning changes, particularly if you want to give density bonuses for the use of TDRs, uh, and zoning is not simple. Um, so it's, it's a lot of work uh, to implement the recommendations that in, in option four, uh, that's just a list of recommendations, but the underlying work is significant. Mm -hmm. But what if is you want your, to get it done right. In terms of um, the planning commission, uh -huh. um, Megan suggested, well, you have the draft mm -hmm. of the open space that says these are the 23 or five parcels. How many is it? 23? 20 is. 20, 25. And so there they are on a map, and you can you see how big they are and where they are. Um, before that's kind of adopted, <laughs> if that's what we're going to do, you can't move forward on some of this work? The TDR work? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, well, I think that's that's part of the, um, you know, the tweaking of this report is to, okay. is to better define you know the sending and receiving areas. The it, using that draft report right. that presumably might have a few more tweaks, but you're probably mm -hmm. not going to change the property. Yep. Um, as the basis for that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yep, I think that's possible. So that I think the major question is so you could go forth and do that. Yep. In yes. Early January. Okay. Mm -hmm. You started or something. Yep. Paul, well, just wanted to sort of put a framework around. The, the Planning Commission did receive a presentation from Alan Strong last week on the, the top parcels, and it's an excellent uh, product that the committee's done. They did not, as I understand it, in their recommendations, recommend what should be done with these properties. Should they be regulated? Should they be purchased fee simple? Should it be some of the property or all the property? And 
And so there are some significant, significantly large properties contained within that list. And so I just want to make sure that as you're having this discussion, uh, Michael's alluded a couple times to this being a, a significant work product. Um, realistically, um, some broad policy recommendations by early spring um, and possibly regulations in the fall of 2020, just to be sort of realistic on the time frame because each one of the receiving zones has neighborhoods around it. The, there will be a lot of interest in each of those neighborhoods as to what the upzoning might be around them. Um, what pushes and pull leverage does the city want to install to each of these areas? Um, are all the properties appropriate to become sending areas? Should some of them be targeted for use of acquisition by the city or other tools? Um, I just want to be clear on the scope of the project. But isn't it more simple? I get it if you're receiving um, for a community or neighborhood. That has a, a potential real big impact on your, where you're living. In terms of identifying sending areas, that seems less intrusive, right? Particularly if you're not eliminating TDR, so you have 25 acres, and you know, you've been telling everyone you're banking on selling the TDRs to send your kids to college, someone that testified, I guess, to your committee. Um, but that, that could still go forward. It's where, who receives them. Sending areas may, identification of sending areas may involve rezoning or downzoning, for example. It's a sending area only on a particular That's process. a down zoning to be a sending well, area only? Means, or uh, could be? Currently, little to no development is allowed in any area that's a sending area. And that's, that's the purpose. They went from being allowed to be built upon to becoming essentially a conservation property. So the, the development potential could be um, significantly reduced on some properties. Uh -huh. But the value in terms of TDRs remains, yeah. right? So if you have 25 TDRs, well, at 0.83 acres, I don't know how many, you know, you're 25 acres. That's it. How many TDRs are but that's a lot. I was supportive of expanding the receiving areas so that there would be less congestion pressure on just the SEQ. Yeah, so me that's too. That's why I'm open yes. and I support expanding just, the receiving areas. That's yeah, for sending. Right, but I, I'm just identify one of the ways you conserve land as open space is to identify it as a sending only area that's right and so but that would be just one one tool for that, conserving yes those but 20 properties or whatever wondering if that is something that can be um, adopted or approved before you actually have the receiving communities and all of this stuff. I was just going to say, um, Please being on the, sorry, Monica Osby, Monica Osby and I'm on both the TDR committee and the planning commission. Um, I would think that there, it doesn't matter if the actual list of, from the open spaces is finalized or not. The, 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 um, the plan of what to do with a new sending area, no matter what it is, can be treated in, um, in whatever the zoning or the, whatever the language is that the Planning Commission can develop. It's the, what the actual parcel is can be assigned later. If the concept is, yes, we want to take X number of X properties, we can work conceptually around and strategically around that and then later, the, the two can meet again um, so that when an actual map is created, the real parcels are there. Um, but this would, but by starting now and just understanding that yes, generally there's a general consensus that some parcels will, will be converted over to sending only, um, that will give the Planning Commission enough to work with, I would think, uh, at this point, um, and then again, when the open space committee is uh, finalized, then we can specifically connect the geography. Paul, do you think that's accurate? Um, in terms of how you 
be convinced. Yeah, I mean, at looking at this from a framework perspective, um, the, 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 there, is, there, there should be some form of a balance between how much acreage is intended to be conserved and what the total amount of receiving widgets are. And so figuring out that balance can be done without knowing the final elements of what the sending are. Um, ultimately, there will need to be you know, policy decisions made around each of the sending areas and each of the receiving areas as to what gets down zone and what, get up, get, what gets either up zoned or up zoned with restrictions. Roseanne, do you have a little time? Um, I'm just going to approach this from a very macro view. So you enacted interim zoning to do three major things, the open space, the TDR, and the PUD. And I'm sure the goal was to have all of those uh, analysis and reports done before interim zoning. The, the Planning Commission had the PUD, uh, and I don't believe that's done yet. Because they weren't just working on PUDs I and mean, inclusionary zoning and other matters came to them. So in the course of the interim zoning period, that was not done. But if you look back, and let's assume it was done. I mean, they've, they've identified it. Let's assume the open space report's done, the TR report is done. This is right exactly where we were in 2014. When we had the, you know, the we had an open space committee, we had um, you know, SUSAG and, and so forth. The reports were all done. The, the uh, people we hired, the, the experts to write them, had written the reports. And in some cases, they even drafted the language to be incorporated into our LDRs. And we're five years later, and that hasn't happened. I, I'm just trying to say, if you don't do it now, who is going to do it? I mean, because the, the plan commission has so much work to do just running, doing planning. Unless you have a special entity to write your LDRs, you might, we might be repeating history again. All the reports are done, but the devil is in the detail. Writing, and we're just talking about in the last 20 minutes, little ins and outs of the TDRs, ascending, receiving, all very important issues that would be difficult to put in writing and would take time. I, you know, Michael's point, which I agree with, is get the job done now. Don't assume that it, It'll get done. I mean, it didn't after the last I see. So, just a cautionary tale that if you're going to do it, finish it. You know, because there well, are I no don't more. disagree. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> unless you want to convene mm -hmm. the volunteers back to write, uh, you know, LDRs. But most people, civilians, are not skilled in how to write, you know, zoning documents. Um, I, I'm just, I just see it happening again. You know. Um, Chair, I mean, the, the question before you is, is the TDR committee's work done with the uh -huh. presentation of this report, or is that your expected deliverable, or is the TDR committee's work not done because we have not produced draft regulations to implement our, the, the recommendations that were made? We ask that that be done. Not by the TDR committee. Not by the TDR committee. I think the, the Planning Commission has to develop the, the um, LDRs. So I guess on that question, I read the report. I thought it, I, I, it was really helpful to read. You included all the minutes and everything, and it was very informative, at least what I got. There was a lot of reading, but it was really informative. And um, I concur personally with your the recommendation of four. I mean, I have some other things, as I've stated, to use land that can never be developed as a trade for greater growth somewhere else, I think, is abusing the system and should be illegal. But uh, that's a different, I mean, I guess when you craft the LDRs, you can make that clear that we're not suggesting that you can preserve something that's already preserved um, for, for uh, I'm going greater to rephrase density. the question in light of David, Dave's comment that is it the expectation of the council that the planning commission will produce uh, the draft regulations under interim zoning as 
part well, of the chart. Well, that would be my expectation, but in terms of the timing, I don't know if that can happen within interim zoning as it's uh, as the timeline is now. So the question will be in you know, a couple of weeks before it ends whether we extend it. As the person who has voted against interim zoning uh -huh. and extending it, I will just say all of these things can still happen after if interim zoning expires. It doesn't stop all this work. These things can still occur outside of these bylaws being in force. But no, well, they but, only but the current LDRs are just making that point. Are oh, it can happen, but it can happen for naught because the current LDRs are in place, which allows for very different things. First quarter of 2020, right, it gives them through March, right? So we just have to be mindful, too. The reason for doing the interim zoning from the Planning Commission perspective was so that they could simply focus on this and get it done. Now, granted, we've gone beyond the six months that they said they needed, right? But these things happen, as we know, right? Um, and which is why we've extended it. And I think we have to be sensitive to the primary impetus behind, you know, giving them nine months, thinking that six months, you know, with all the time to get off the ground was maybe too quick for this to truly come to fruition. And we're at I, 15 months now though, right? Like we've extended to 15 months. We are, but the initial impetus was to allow the planning commission to finish <coughs> their PUD. <coughs> that was the reason for choosing that time limit. And I want us to really keep that in mind that our planning commission's time is valuable and that that is the reason why we declared interim zoning to begin with. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes? I don't, don't quite agree with that. I mean, interim zoning came into being, this particular version of, of, of interim zoning because of the people's presentation. You, you were, the council got clear, it took both clear is, yeah instructions from the residents of South Burlington that they don't want all this, they want development on yes. open space going on. If we don't do it now, interim zoning comes to an end, it's open season. But Michael, the, the, the little you need three votes on this left, board. The little land that we've got <laughs> left in the SEQ, because that's the only place you can use TDRs, yes. will be gone. Michael, you need three votes on this board for anything to be extended, right? So let's just be realistic. Yeah. Yes, it was people powered. But in terms of this board determining a timeline, it was based on the Planning Commission's timeline. And that is what I want to remind the people who are going to be voting whether or not to extend, yeah. right? Okay. So it's, it's really, um, you know, important to keep in mind the first quarter of 2020. Um, that we see in this timeline, which is why I asked, does that mean January? And the answer was no, that's what I understood. So it's important for us to keep that. I mean, Earth Economics won't be ready with their report before no. the current. But you have two members of this committee, okay, yep. who voted for interim zoning, who are looking to your timeline in order to say, yes, I will vote for it, and it should only be this long, okay? So two of the four votes that got us to where we are today. I just want us to be mindful of that. So are we in agreement that the TDR committee has completed their work and that this report we can task? Yes, and you were the first to complete it. Well, I would just Have comment that yeah. the, the, the space committee's got this. Yeah, the planning commission is still reviewing it and we may have minor comments on it. Okay. But what I what I want to make oh. clear for the public because this TDR keeping track of and it's all very you know it's too it's too hazy. It's too, you know, it's like mud. We have in the records, I'm assuming, <coughs> some list of who has TDRs, who has sold TDRs, who has purchased TDRs. This can be found. I mean, it's not only Tim going to, you know, look at the properties and going and calling those landowners. We have records, right, in our vault. Right? I, uh, I would defer yes. to Paul. I would say <laughs> yes. So, so just to be clear, every TD, under the state law, all TDRs that are transferred through development review must be recorded in the land records with a plaque. <coughs> so there is an exact location of every TDR that has moved from 
parcel A to parcel B. Um, in addition to but that, for each move, there's a there's a location, or they're all sent with centralized? each move. The state law says that let's say a house is built in the Rye neighborhood, which used TDRs. When they trip the point when they need TDRs, it must be recorded in the land records exactly where those came from, along with a deed restricting that par par parcel from future development. A survey. In a survey. So, the land. for that example, that portion of the parcel. Yes. Correct. Okay. So there's a portion of the Auclair parcel that has a exact portion of where TDRs have been, the, the term that the state uses is severed. They've been removed from development. Separate from that, so, so that we maintain. Separate from that, with the work, um, thanks to Tom Bailey and Michael, we have um, a list of um, using our, our GIS mapping, essentially, all of the land that is within uh, the Natural Resource Protection District and approximate or close to how many acres exists in each one of those which would provide an, an overall close estimate of the amount of TDRs available. Um, sometimes they get severed as I just used as an example. In some cases they get used within a development. So the South Point neighborhood for instance, all the homes are relatively close to Spear Street they used up all the TDR potential from the eastern portion of their property. So it's so we have to we have to account for that and that we have in a parcel by parcel basis. But that um, thanks to Michael and Tom, we've got a pretty good handle on across the board. And Paul, who did a very very detailed analysis, which none of us would have been able to do. Okay. So, have we answered your question? I think so. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure that Bernie has answered my question because the tweaking. This was the tweaking for me. Well, you, we can talk about yeah. that separately. So, but you uh, remember in the planning commission meeting where you presented this, Art, in particular, had some comments. He wrote this. Okay. Yeah. So, so the process going forward, then. So just so I understand this. So we've kind of said to you, you're looking at the. Um, TDR final, their final report. Mm -hmm. The Planning Commission might make some adjustments or tweaks to that final report. Does that then come to us, or have we looked at it and said, you know, we like the, you know, number four? And um, I would expect that if the Planning Commission had any final changes, that you present it. We would. We would let the TDR committee know these are the specific things that we would like you to add, subtract, flesh out. They would do that and then the planning commission would then present that as this is 100% done. Right now I would say it's 90% done or 95% done, but before we got it to 100% done we wanted to make sure this is what you were looking for. The one question I have for Michael, Monica, and Tim, are the business uses not currently permitted as part of your recommendation, right? The map uses TDRs in conjunction with current zoning to increase residential density, and in some cases, business uses not currently permitted. What does that refer to? Um, it might refer to, uh, uh, I'm not correct if I'm wrong here, but maybe in a commercial property that the, the uh, uh, allowable lot density is 50%. You can build on 50% of the lot. However, with each TDR that you buy, you can get another 10,000 square feet. Gotcha. All right. But, so. but I thought we were limited by the statute to units only, to, to residential units. So we have to be the careful. The statute about doesn't what refer to residential uh, units as you copied it. We talked yeah. about statute multiple it could be density, lot coverage, or other measurements of bulk. Those, those are the those are the options. Bulk, 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 bulk. like going up. It could be square footage. It could be building coverage. Th those are the restrictions. Density, um, square footage, and bulk. There might be a requirement uh, 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 in the zone that you can you can only have 
three stories. Right. Yes. So bulk is going up. So is that what you mean? Good. It's uh, bulk could be going up. It could be going out. It could be. It's 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 broadly written to be the things that measure the size of something. Um, but it can't be, for instance, uh, one use versus another use. Okay. Um, restaurants, but not offices. The allowance of a, it, it has to be an amount of something. Does that make sense? Yes. So I have density, square footage, and bulk, meaning height and lot coverage. Amen. I'm so glad. Yes to that. <laughs> okay. Good. We're good? I think we're good. All right. Roseanne? Thank you. You asked the question, but I never heard the answer. Is the PUD uh, done? I mean, we know about open space. No, the PUD lot. is not done. So that's not done either. First quarter okay. of 2020. That's when that That's done. close to being done, okay. correct, okay. Paul? Yes. Yeah, it just isn't quite done. Okay. Right. Working. Something for the new Working year. to meet the deadline. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. A lot of work. <laughs> and all for free. Thank you to our volunteers. We need to do more things for our volunteers. Yes, we do. We, we, the Helen brings cookies. I bring cookies. <laughs> oh, okay. I saw those. What do you do? Yeah, I'm just asking. I'm just wondering. Please pass them around. Here. I'm with you. I want to do more. Just some more numbers. Okay, moving on to uh, item 13. This is the review and possibly approve the errors and omissions report from the tax assessor for the 2019 grand list. Did we have that in our packet? No. Oh, okay. I was thinking. Well, I didn't remember reading it, so I was like, oh, okay. So Todd had um, shared this listing with me. I didn't ask him to be here tonight because there's nothing that represents any change in value. But it's merely corrections, misspellings, uh, wrong address, uh, those types of, of comments. But as a requirement of our charter for the grand list, uh, these corrections need to be approved by the city council every year. So there are some on the back as well. Um, it's and that's kind of the short list as you can remember we've had years that this has been eight or more pages long Are these new rental properties when the mailing address changes um, I'm not sure maybe I'll find out yeah because do we usually have this many mailing address changes no, I don't Seems like an enormous number of corrections. Like, has something changed in terms of how we gather data? This this is a shorter list than is typical. Oh. Yeah, it's usually, well, I've seen it 8 to 13 pages long. And there's been this many mailing address changes? That's what I meant. That not, oh, not always on the mailing address yeah, now. Yeah. No. What it's, typically it's, causes a mailing address change? Change of address. Wrong number. Uh, of the house, uh, misspelling of the name of oh, the road. Oh, it could be as simple as a misspelling. Uh, just a change, yeah, but not, not the actual address has changed, or could the address right. actually be the the last Rarely. Person who yeah, more likely either the number dyslexic? for the road. I just want to say I, I do see a lot in the, not only, but a number, I'm not saying even, I didn't count, I'm not saying mostly, but I see a lot in the chamber of the neighborhood. Yeah, the mailing address changed. Why would you think that's so? Uh, I mean, oh, because they've they become rentals? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Because of the gorilla, the 35,000-pound gorilla in our neighborhood. Okay. Well, all right. All right, do we need Todd to approve this? Mm -hmm. We do. I'll move that we approve the errors and emissions report from the tax assessor for the 2019 Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. We can as a liquor board. Did you guys get the background the for... The weird window? Weird window brewing? Yes, it was about 85 pages. Okay. Well, we should <laughs> talk about the content. I mean, really? <laughs> well, it was a separate... It was a separate... I know, it's yeah, a separate okay. thing. It went on. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> So that begs a question. Should the council be privy to, to some of those documents in there? I mean, we were successful in, in getting the social security numbers covered. 
Should we be privy to some of this background check information? I mean, part right. of the requirement for us to be able to see it is for the for the application for the, for right? the state for state because yeah. this thing goes on to the state liquor control board. right right but do I'm just curious do do we need to see that but we swear to uphold Vermont laws so we are I think also held accountable to maintain private information private I, I understand I mean this couple went to an excessive amount of any infractions all voluntary oh well, I know yeah. I know I feel yeah. like yeah. Math test in eighth grade. I took it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't believe how much stuff they have. Oh, no, no, we've we, never seen no, before. We don't talk about it. No, I'm not going to share it. But it was just Everybody remarkable was, yeah. to me. I mean, usually it's just a speeding speed ticket yeah. or a DUI or something big. But this was oh, I mean. I, <laughs> All right, I move to approve. I'm oh, I okay. move to enter the Liquor Control Board. Good second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we are now um, the Liquor South Burlington Liquor Control Commission. We have <laughs> one um, application before us for the Weird Window Brewing LLC. I move to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Any, uh, any discussion? This is the former Farden? Yes. Miss Farden. It was, oh, they had some really, <laughs> some really good beer. But anyway, let's vote. Well, they probably sell beer, too. They're well, I'm sure the new company is going to have good beer, too. So. Any other discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Um, reports from counselors on committee assignments. We exit the oh, I'm sorry. I I motion to, to adjourn to, the... I move to exit the liquor control room. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so moving on. Reports from counselors on committee assignments. Does anyone have any? I'd like to report a few things at uh, GMT. Oh, good. Uh, so one, we're facing a, a, a very tough budget year. Uh, and I, I just want to say again, these things don't generate themselves. So I just really appreciate all of the articulation and clarity you give us throughout the budget process. I'm not faulting GMT at all, but I just say we're not looking at nearly as a, as a sustainable picture right now. We're short, falling short about a million dollars. Last year was a million dollars. It's, we've been, we've completed all of our reserves. So we've opened up conversations with a variety of legislators, but we are making some, some very deep and painful cuts. And so uh, that's going to happen over the next month or two. It's going to be service cuts as well as others. Um, I'm also, tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. is the last meeting um, that I will be chairing. I'm going to be stepping down as chair as of January 1st, and that was already the case for quite some time. I was going to do it last July, but I extended for six months. But I will stay on the board as long as you all are still okay with me there. But the new chair will be Bonnie Weniger, and we have yet to get the <coughs> vice chair. I, I plan to stay active, and I, we are engaged with the state health with, with the variety of conversations about more sustainable funding methods uh, that are, we see in other states being car registration fees. I'd also love to be able to assess the rural communities in the same way our urban communities are assessed, like us. Uh, so we're looking at a variety of different ways, uh, creative ways for the long-term sustainability of public transportation in the state. But sadly, I would expect that uh, we can see a de uh, decrease in service hours in South Burlington next year just because we can't continue to offer the frequency um, necessary. We've got to find the savings somewhere. We're finding it in a variety of places. Is that at late night? It'll be um, likely. No, it all has to be approved by the board. But uh, everything I'm seeing is uh, midday. So part of the next gen was to go to 20 minutes throughout the day. Right. And so that consistency was a big plus, and it just it helps for people that use it to get to work. But we'll probably go out the red minutes line. during the midday. So that saves about two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year on that frequency. And we're going to look at other cuts in the rural areas. So, uh, I, I well, you're going to ask them for money. Interesting. It's a tough situation. Good luck on that one. So, uh, how, much, how much of your revenue is just fares? Uh, about 2.2 million. Right now, Tim Ash as well as Kurt McCormick are intrigued by the notion of fare free because we should see ridership increase. We just need to find about right. 2 million. Right. Dollars That's all just to, yeah. Yeah. And that represents what percent of your budget? <coughs> $22 million budget. So it's 10%. It's, it's, so it's not out unheard of, but where does that money come from? Well, I don't understand. I've got some other ideas and I could talk to you about it, but I don't think this body would have much influence over that. You start giving away fares for free and then you dig yourself a, a bigger hole. You cut back service and people get disenchanted and go back to driving their cars. I think, uh, you know, honestly, this is, this is a problem that's been around for decades. 
it doesn't seem to be getting, you know, everybody keeps hoping. It's gonna, people are going to get out of their cars. They're going to get on the, on the buses. They're going to make more progress. Somehow it doesn't seem we ever make progress on any public transportation. It's very disheartening, really. And you can't go, the rural communities are all stretched in on their budgets. You're going to go ask them for more money? Forget it. I just want to be able, they already are giving us money, but every year to go to 45 plus communities and ask for a 3% increase, and sometimes they cut us from the budget because you get new select board members and they are looking to trim. I want to just be able to send them a bill, a reasonable amount, it's about five to $10,000 in the smaller communities. That graduates each year. That would make our rural side more sustainable. And our, our support is statutory, isn't it? We are part so of the, Colchester is flirting with joining. Just go up. Colchester might join as a member community. We're going to be discussing a service agreement with it that would get us to there. How much do we pay now? Five hundred and twenty-five thousand last year. Wait, will you set that assessment tomorrow? So for tomorrow we'll be voting on um, the board might go for five percent increase. Last year we were at four percent. I, representing the interests of South Burlington, am currently only supporting a four percent increase. If you want to influence that, uh, I can go another way. But I, I, we already increased it last year to four percent, and now this year again we're trying to find. <coughs> about everywhere. I just feel like we are overtaxed <coughs> urban communities and I, I want to find more ways for all of our five counties to contribute. Uh, and I, I, I'm currently only at the 4%, but if you all say you're ready to go 5%, talk to as long as he's okay with it. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that difference is. It's probably about four or $5,000. Well, I commend you for the, for the attempt you've made. It, uh, it's most unfortunate. I, I, I love the bus. I just I just I have to follow up on what you said, which was very disheartening and well, and we can't leave it on that note. I have to say that when it's horrible weather outside, I am so glad to just go on the bus. I let someone else deal with the must the mess, deal with the traffic. I can sit, I can read, I can do my emails, I am in a warm, comfortable environment. I love commercial. I love the bus. I, yes, and I love your new routes. I love the next gen. I can go from 20 to 30 minutes. I think that's reasonable. But I just, I find it to be just an oh, duh. Well, all I'm saying is it's, it's, been, it's been a battle we've been fighting for years and years and years. I remember, I remember back in the House Transportation Committee 30 years ago, same discussion, same argument, same problem, same challenges, and it just is... It's For just a matter of seeing the light. It's true, it, to me, it was a matter of seeing the light because I was someone stuck in my car with my little parking sticker, getting through all that bottleneck to get to UVM for years, right? And all of a sudden, they made parking much more difficult at UVM. I said, let me try. And it was like, why haven't I been doing this since day one? This is a dream. It is. A dr it is. You should just lobby the... the the, the state house to increase the gas tax by 75 cents. Yeah. So, for what it's worth, some of that for GNT. For what it's worth, ridership is finally increasing, but we had four declining years. And to your point, ridership on public transportation tracks exactly inversely to gas prices right. yeah. and the economy. Mm -hmm. so, sure. Well, the better the economy, the less they take. Them. So, to your point, increase gas prices, the gas taxes, people will take public transportation more. Or if we have a major economic downturn, that would really help out. <laughs> yeah. Hard to root for that, though. Root for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, okay. things are finally increasing. I do want to make that clear. We're up, I think, six or seven percent ridership, but there was four solid years of double-digit declines. Well, that year, even the in gas Chittenden County, across the board. The year the gas went over four bucks. Do you, do you have any recollection of what happened? I'm just curious. Oh, the transportation was at an all-time high, if I recall correctly. You know, the okay. whole paradigm. <laughs> But I've used up a lot of time on this. I just thought I'd give you some heads up. And no, thanks. Okay. Well, no, it's worth five thousand dollars to spend some time. Okay. I, I would like you to stay at four percent if you can, personally. I, I, I don't know. There might be a majority of voters to go to five, but I well, I, I get that. But I think um, that's where I am. I mean, do you want some, like a little vote or something, or people? Wishing for it to go up to five percent, or it might anyway. Well, I just, I, I, I just to put it out there. When I had a conference in Washington D.C., um, free transportation, Georgetown, free transportation, and they did that after um, 
some kind of catastrophe. Was it, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I've been grading for, for weeks on end, so I cannot, and we don't need to dwell. But it, it, it's something that municipalities do invest in. It is part of the plan to create, you know, an environmental plan. And a, and a smart energy plan. So I'm, if it's four or five thousand dollars, I tend to say I'd go for five. Um, you know, Burlington still has that that part of now it's the purple line. It's still number eleven. They still have it on the bus. That's free, going up to the hospital from you know the um, old north or is it the new north end where it starts? I can't remember, but. Um, that's because it serves a purpose. It serves a social purpose, and there's something to that. So, so it actually, uh, it will only be about three thousand, but it will be a larger so increase because we're recalculating. It. But the four or five percent difference, three thousand. Three thousand. That and <laughs> the other option, I, I'd go for three thousand. It would be three thousand more than what we pay now. And the ADA assessments add to another 200? That we can't control. Well, you're the, you're the chair at the moment, and you've been watching this more closely than anybody else. So I value your opinion. What do you think we should do? I want to stay at 4% for four. the following reason. I have a letter from our auditor, who is Ron Smith, who we all know. And he wrote a very nice letter. He's been with us for eight years, uh, that he, too, uh, sees our financial our sustainably unfinan unsustainable financial app picture. And he looks to the funding formula for the rural communities, uh, that it is unsustainable since we merged in 2009. We need to extend the same methodology that we use for the urban communities for the, our entire service network, but that didn't happen. So we wrote a letter saying we need to look at our birthright, open up our charter, and find a fairer funding method across mm -hmm. our entire service region. So I'm at 4% because I want to put pressure on that, but mm -hmm. I, I also want GMT to succeed. So I'm, I'm on sure, the bubble here, and I didn't want to be the deciding vote tomorrow is what I was kind of hoping. It said you felt we should go to five percent. I've gone with that, but you're the expert on this one, and I'll go with what you said. While I fully understand what what Megan has said, because if they can accomplish the same purpose with some added pressure based on the auditor's recommendations, that's the right thing to do. So that's what we should try. Okay. I'm going to I'll go with the five percent. All right, but if I'm not, then uh, the four. Huh? And tomorrow. We'll go with what you what you decide is best. Okay. Any other committee assignments? Just that we put together the final parcels. We put together the final narratives on the parcels, and it's been presented to the planning commission, and we'll, we will soon yeah, have it in our open, hands. Open space, you mean? Yeah, yeah, open yeah. space. I see. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Here are. Valiant member who's done a lot of legwork for the committee. I just want to thank him publicly. Uh, in addition to Alan Strong, um, Duncan Murdoch as well, and Allison Chalmick. And Amanda has done amazing work yeah, on the Bike and Ped committee. Cool committee. It's, it's an amazing committee of people. We've had Bernie, um, and you know that we, yeah, and Tammy Zilka. It's it's just it's yeah. And Tammy is very detail oriented. One, yeah, it's just an amazing committee. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. Okay. Um, airport Commission meets Wednesday. Um, I had hoped for this committee that I would have had the final draft of the MOU, but I haven't gotten that yet from the mayor. A lot of things on his plate. He is coming to the Airport Commission. Um, I think I mentioned that last time um, to share his thoughts on the MOU and on this Wednesday. He's early on in the uh, close to four o'clock, like four ten or something. So anyway, so I don't have anything else to report. Next time I will. He has had an yes, he has. Unfortunately for him, yeah. Um, anything else? Okay. Uh, it's nine o'clock. Do you want to like take a quick, little quick stretch, and then we will um, come back for the final couple yeah. issues. We don't have much to go. Mm -hmm.
So I'd like to call back into order <coughs> the South Burlington City Council meeting of Monday, December 16th, 2019. And we will pick up at item 16, which is the council discussion and possible approval of a proposal from Earth Economics to conduct a cost benefit analysis of certain properties within the city of South Burlington. So Kevin. So the, um, I went back to Earth Economics with the refinement of the mission, um, and they came back to us with the proposal that I sent to you that was um, more uh, tightly honed in on the 20, I think I said to them, <coughs> properties that have been identified by the Open Space Committee. What those properties are can be decided at some point, but the response is that the one that I, they came back to you and I sent to you. Well, they so. haven't started with the 20 properties we have identified. The, the, they have the map, don't they? They haven't started with it. You guys actually need to approve need their to approve proposal it. Approve it. and the price can. tag for that. You like it? I guess so. You like it? Yeah, I think it, I think it responds to the change, the kind yeah. of the change in focus uh, well. They still are looking at a February completion date. It's half the, roughly half the price of the old one. So if, if it meets your expectations and needs. Uh, John Stewart continues on with uh, more uh, budget, specific budget-related portion of that study. Um, but if you, if you want to uh, give me the go-ahead tonight, we'll get on the phone tomorrow and have them crank it up. I'll move the we. Is that what you're going to do? No. No. But I'm just going to say I'm still going to vote against it. I voted against it the last time. I just don't think it's worth $27,000. I don't think it's going to tell us anything we don't already know, and I'd rather spend $27,000 on more paving. But, again, I'm not going to try to convince you guys. I, I just don't think this report is necessary to continue down the path we are going towards a sensible, smart growth and conservation, and that's all I'm going to say. Tom, I, I understand what you say, but I do think we'll learn something because we've got experts who will confirm what we might surmise, but we're not the experts, and I think it will give us some data for the future that can be valuable going forward and and for that price with 20 parcels that have been clearly identified by a committee that's worked really hard to identify them and asking us to do something with them and understand their value um, I think this is probably something that's a, that's a valid expenditure I'm not jumping up and down about it but I'm okay with it that's that's just my reasoning and so for that I would move our approval and as far as February is concerned you know everything we've talked about and everything we do takes longer because it's predominantly volunteers people take vacations people have people some people have jobs um, <laughs> you know and, uh, and you know and it's hard to schedule meetings and then you have the holidays and who knows what else or a snowstorm and and so reality is reality so let's just do the best we can so i i think this is probably something we should do and it'll be done when they say it'll be done fine other comments we need a second second oh. okay any other comments <coughs> from the council <coughs> thoughts michael before you vote on this uh, i have a, some questions about the basic assumptions that earth economics has made uh, in the first table that they presented um, they say uh, business as usual, the cost of degraded eco ecosystems and the loss of ecosystem services and the benefits would be revenue from property tax. We already know that open land returns, uh, the, the return on open lands are quite beneficial to a city and we also know from the um, uh, Vermont Natural Resources Council that uh, expanding the grand list or the population shows that in and they've done this over a number of years for 20% of towns in, in Vermont that have a population of over uh, in several categories but they've shown that the tax the taxes go up they don't go down when the grand list is expanded or the population expands. So uh, I don't think that's a valid uh, assumption on their part that uh, the benefits are gonna be revenue from property taxes. Uh, when you expand, uh, the revenue doesn't cover the additional costs of infrastructure. I, I, 
I, I got to say something about that, Michael, because I've been quoted on that um, as it relates to the sustainability of the budget. Yep. And I, I was taken out of context on that. It had nothing to do with growth when I made that comment. I, oh. think, I think that... Uh, um, I'm not referring to consider the sources of where that came from as whether or not those sources are valid representations of the issue. I know the person who made those representations in Vermont over the last 20 years, and um, I don't think that it, it went without some bias going in. So I'm going to say, I, I yes, I wasn't referring to anything that you say. Yeah, well, no, I, I I use that opportunity to bring that up because I think I was taken out of context. That's um, not what I meant. Yeah, it's a it's a study that was done by the Vermont Natural Resource Council and yeah. the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, and I believe that Alan uh, Strong presented at least one one part of it. Um, yes, he, he, he did. He did. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a question in my mind of where they're starting from, that maybe that's not a good place to start from. Um, and that uh, the costs of, the costs of open space are lower revenue Uh, and because uh, and the benefits are preserved ecosystems, yes, but I don't think uh, it's necessarily a lower revenue. Um, there are other state um, organisations that have, and it may may also be the Vermont Natural Resources Council, that have shown uh, a, a <coughs> very good return on open land. Yeah, but I think Figure Two gets to that return, right? Where we have air quality biological control, climate stability, disaster risk reduction, genetic... The benefits of ecosystems are in table two years. Yes, so that's the return, right? So yeah. they are going to be quantifying that return. In addition to looking at, you know, tax, income tax, or property taxes it's, it's, that we collect. Yeah, and they're yeah. going to be doing it at, for each parcel. Should we have a motion right? on the table? Yes. Yeah. 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 Because we could talk about this all night, and I have lots of opinions, but I don't want to keep us here all night. So I, I think I've said what I wanted to say, and I think <laughs> you should take note of, of my concern about those basic assumptions by Earth Economics. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, discussion? Okay, you ready for the vote? Okay, all in favor of um, having our city manager um, agree to a this um, proposal from. Earth Economics for 26,000 and change. Um, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay, so it carries four to one. Thank you. And thank you, Kevin, for following up with on this. Thank you. So the question I guess I have, because I'm not sure that it was understood before and it came to me as you were Will they now be able to look at those 20 parcels, or do we need to approve the 20 parcels before they look at them? I think if, if you can get from the Open Space Committee the 20 that are... Sent them to you. Yeah, but would you go back and just confirm it? Because I, have, oh, I think I, I have two it. different things. Can you... Let me put it this way. Can you send the list to me again yes. after this vote, and then I'll send that tomorrow. Yes. Good. Thank you. Okay. okay thank you. <coughs> um, item 17. Council discussion and possible approval of amendment to the Natural Resources Committee authorization that would adjust the number of members on the committee and the number of members to achieve. So as you may have uh, heard, the Natural Resources Committee is down um, several members and we have been advertising for new members to join the committee and we have not gotten any applicants yet. This has caused a problem for the Natural Resources Committee and their ability to um, conduct their business. Mm -hmm. I would like to propose to the council that you set in a motion the number of committee members for the Natural Resources Committee at anywhere between six and nine, and that a quorum shall represent one half of the committee members plus one at any given time on that range. Of active appointments. Of active yes. appointments. This will allow, I'm so, so moved. Second. Okay, discussion, or you want a so, clarification? If we say seven, then it's 
four and a half people, so they yeah. got to cut somebody. Five. Oh, four. If it's seven, it's four. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Take it cut in half. Right, and, and one. then one, right. Okay. Right. So, but, yeah. oh, yeah. But if it's an odd number, it's okay, right? So, yes. Do we have specific, <laughs> do we need, do we have specific wording on that? Or is it just what you're pretty working? much what I just said? Okay, because you are the city council and you and these are your committees, you can yes. decide. What was the current number they have? Nine is nine. nine. Well, that's authorized what we, for nine. Yeah. They're authorized for so they nine. So, this allows them to continue to be yeah. um, a viable committee if someone resigns or right. we can only fill two of the spots, okay. but they can still go forward as a the optimal, the optimal is nine. Yeah. And we'll continue to work to advertise for nine. And we really oh. encourage people to think about a Christmas gift, or, or, or sorry, a holiday gift to someone as uh, encouraging them to apply. <laughs> a nomination. A nomination, yeah. <laughs> for the new year. Try to convince someone they know. <laughs> okay. um, David has his hand up, so he would like to say something. Uh, I'm speaking as a former chair of the Natural Resource Committee. Uh, the Natural Resource Committee is going through a bit of a troubled time. I had to resign for personal reasons and all, but uh, I think that we really do appreciate the <coughs> commitment that the council is trying to make to help us through this period. And thank you for that. Um, so. Uh, Still a very interested member of the committee, but uh, not the chair. Okay, thank you. Okay, everyone ready for the vote? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. Is there any other? Oh, I'm sorry. We can skip down to the first. No, the executive session. Twenty possible council action on extending the right of first refusal related to the conservation of property. We have, uh, this relates to the Eau Claire issue that oh. Paul raised with you at the last meeting. We've uh, reached an agreement with, uh, oh, right, yeah. with uh, Wild Turkey Divide LLC, which was Dirt Capital, or is Dirt Capital, to extend the um, right of first refusal period till such time as we have an appraisal on the property. And within four weeks after that, so it's well, their uh, dirt capital. Dirt capital. Do they change their this. name, or they no, have another name? I think name? that's. I think that's what this the project. project is called. Oh, this project is yeah, called. Yeah, it's an LLC. Okay. So this relieves any pressure that you have today on making a decision about exercising the option. Okay. And so I think I don't think you need to do anything. Tonight. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Well, good. All right. Um, possible executive session. Do we still need that to yeah. receive confidential attorney-client communications relating to the append, uh, pending appeal of the City of Burlington zoning permit 20-0514CA. There is no other business. And right? no just, other. Yeah, no other business. And you Wait, don't have to. Have other business. I have some other business. Oh. Okay. No other business at the executive session is what I meant. All right. Okay. So before we go into executive session, there's some other business? Just really briefly. Okay. Okay. So one, Public Works needs to put the 25 mile an hour speed limit sign back up on northbound Spear Street at Quarry Hill entrance. The police department cannot issue tickets until they put that sign back up because they paved it and it's been lacking since the I think went. about that every day when I stay at 35. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'll, uh, it's on the list. I, I know, I know, and I, I know everybody's busy. There's, there's been some snow and stuff. Don't they have one of those big things you just turn the drill on and go right down and stick the sign? And they hit a gas line. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay. You know. Is there any other business? And then there, there are a couple there's potholes right opening up. I just want to yes. point them out. Yeah. There was one on Farrell Street next to Eastwood Common One. I, I think it is. Is it? Is it there? And there's another one that's on Spear down, like it's on the uphill north side after you go to the interstate, it's somewhere down there. And it's, it's, you know, it's a delamination, but the problem is once that water gets in there and freezes, it's just gonna start breaking up and get deeper, and, you know. Yeah. We've got the honey wagon, let's go out and, and 
take it. Third one on Kimball, I have $1,300 damage. Just <laughs> this broken really shock. The broken shock suspender. Oh, oh wait, wait. Oh, I thought you were Your making Your car? A, yeah. I thought you were making a joke about the bridge Where? being out. That's the biggest pothole. Kimball, yeah. Kimball Avenue. Where's that one? I'll ask my husband exactly where. It's been it was down there all the way the other day. No Kimball. Oh, yeah. I was like, which which direction? That erratic French driving. Is this? <laughs> I don't think uh, so. He's pretty safe. Which, He's pretty good driver. I drive Kimball a lot. I don't. I'll ask him specifically. I'll yeah. send that to tell Kevin him, along with the maps. Put a pin on it, right? And send it out. After the weather that we've had the last couple of weeks, it's yeah. no surprise. Yeah. Okay. Any other Thanks business? Okay, no other business? Well, then I would entertain a motion to go into executive session. But <coughs> Briefly stated before the pending appeal. <coughs> Second. All in favor? Oh, and oh. oh, and I invite oh. Colin McNeil. <laughs> yeah, did, I had, oh, I, had specific... I knew you when you were little. <laughs> yeah, I thought you looked familiar. Oh my or young, I should yeah. say. <laughs> yeah, you're little now. <laughs> well, you're taller. Yeah. Okay. And um, <laughs> and you are you? Yes. Tom and Tom, 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 Tom does not yeah, Okay. You, you and we will not be coming back into session for any. So that we will adjourn um, following that. Um, uh, executive session. <laughs>